where I'm like, demons don't fucking belong in this movie. See, that's I had the exact opposite thing because I felt like the supernatural aspect of Hereditary was always looming, so the ending felt more earned. And we also, have flipped opinions on this. Yeah, I, I've actually encountered a lot of people with this. Uh, people who either agree with me about Hereditary or people who like The Witch better because the movies are juxtaposed a lot because they're made by the same production company and like similar type things. You know, it'd be amazing is if uh, the guy who plays the dad in the witch did like he would do um he would just dub over movies with everybody having his voice <laughs> <laughs> that would be pretty awesome wouldn't it I, i'm thinking because i remember i hated the dad in that movie but like he, the actor gave a fucking this is my voice. I, the actor gave such a fucking powerful performance like if i hate a character in a movie like genuinely it's because the actor gave a great performance yeah i want to see him do like um like a voiceover dubbing just like that for like a, a studio Ghibli movie. But I know cause a lot of people hated the ending of hereditary, but like there's also the slightly surrealist element to it. I think where like, it's the reason that I don't hate the witches movie. Um, because the last five minutes, one, if you let the last five minutes of a movie ruin the rest of it for you, you're not a love it or leave it yeah. type of guy, um, at least in most cases. But there's always the aspect of like, could this be like a visual metaphor for the fact that like she's given up faith in Christianity, in her family and everything. So she's now subscribed to the opposite ideology that she's been taught is evil. The well, I mean, time. she's literally doing that. She's literally doing, but do you mean like in, as a flight of fancy? Like, yeah. And hereditary did that more so for me, where it's just like, there's a history of mental illness throughout this family. Right. Hence the title. And the mothers and the grandmothers involved in this crazy fucking cult scheme to sacrifice yeah, three members of the family to a demon in order to gain vast wealth and power. Is it entirely possible that like the son is just fucking insane? Just like, yeah, sure. This is what's going on right now. Sure. Like I'm willing to suspend disbelief for that part. So I feel hereditary, like because of the central themes of it and the fact that the supernatural aspect was a key plot in the movie it earned that ending where I was kind of baffled when people were just like, that ending came out of nowhere. I'm just like, no, it kind of built up to it the entire time. Yeah. I mean, that could be a potential commentary we do. It's unfortunate to me too, because I felt like that movie takes a really amazing performance from Tony Collette. Yeah. And I felt like it kind of fumbled the strings a little bit in terms of following everything through. But Max, you know, another movie that has like a really interesting ending that might sour some people to it but i really well not lady abelique whoever wants to watch that movie Dark fuck. welcome to the spectator film podcast i'm austin i'm max and i guess we don't have a movie to do no today. we're it's over okay bye you can find us at spectatorfilmpodcast.com where uh, we have episodes up on spotify itunes and stitcher subscribe to us on youtube and uh, smash the like button smash that like with button. your face yes just like does somebody smash their face in <laughs> hereditary? I mean, like that girl against that telephone pole. Oh god. <laughs> <laughs> okay, oh. Austin, what movie are we doing today? For today Sarah? we're doing Lady Avalique. Okay. <laughs> and it was my choice. Um surprising. It, quite surprising, much like the ending of this movie. Um we don't have to say because we generally don't care about this, but just in case you're one of the weird people who is looking up a podcast about this movie and you have not seen it yet, you have erred. I'm letting you know that now so you can stop uh, because there's no reason for you to listen to this. Oh, yeah. None at all. Totally nothing really crazy or unexpected happens this, in this movie. So you don't have to listen to this because it's But you it's should watch it. It's, it is a very good movie. If you're curious, maybe watch it. But listen, nothing crazy happens in it. Yeah, so right? we normally don't care about spoiler warnings, but if you haven't seen the movie, uh, go watch it and then come revisit it with yeah, us. Yeah, time to stop being coy. Watch the movie first. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, just as a general, if for whatever reason this is your <laughs> first introduction to us, our normal format is... We we'll, never have spoiler warnings. Yeah, we never have spoiler warnings. Normally we'll talk about... Yeah, some things beforehand, normally our histories and our opinions on the movies real quick. And then we'll start watching it. Um, 
Ideally, we would like you to watch along with us, but if you just want to listen to us react to the movie, that's okay, too. Well, ideally, we'd have an audience in the first place. That, too. But You're talking to ghosts. We're speaking, we're speaking to our hypothetical audience. Um, it's the, a, the reader over our shoulder. Our, the, our audience is a metaphor, <laughs> Austin. For what? For our need for Maybe attention. we were the audience all along. <laughs> the real audience is the friendship we made along the Maybe way. Maybe we were the cannibals all along. Um, but... <laughs> Yeah, so that's our normal format, um, and we're going to stick mostly to that. But yeah, this is a movie that Austin pitched to me as having benefit yeah, benefit from seeing it with no knowledge going in and then revisiting it, and we would like for you to have that same experience. Yeah, because this is definitely a movie that it, you're going to value in terms of the experience of watching it. Um, and we can dive more into that during the movie. But in terms of my history with this and why I chose it, I, I think I watched it for the first time Oh my God, close to 10 years ago. Uh, oh God. Um, it was one of the first Criterion movies I ever purchased because it has this awesome cover of like a dude with a wet face in a, in, in like a bathtub and it, it's gross, disgusting water, water. And then a red hand is like, I got your face. And it's like pushing him down. In the I water. really do like the cover. The cover's almost like old propaganda postery almost. It's very like, graphic looking. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's a really striking cover. So I'm like, wow, that looks like it's got murders. The title, I know that means devils or something in French. Yeah. That looks cool. So I bought it and I'm like, oh, this is like a Hitchcock movie, non Hitchcock movie. And that is more accurate than you would think. Uh, it's, it's very, this very much could have been a Hitchcock movie. And in many ways, this shaped a large portion of Hitchcock's career after this movie. I know we didn't talk about that much during the uh, preparation screening, but this movie, I think, is maybe more influential throughout film history than a lot of people understand because of the big movies that it influenced. And uh, it made a, a strong impression on me the first time I watched it about 10 years ago. And it's definitely the type of movie that I've revisited a bunch because there's lots of, there's, it has a strong ability to just sit down and be like, we're watching this. You know, it's one of those older movies that, you know, even if you find an older movie very enjoyable and worthwhile, sometimes you have to mentally prepare yourself for a different type of pace or something, at least in my experience. Oh, no, I definitely agree yeah. with you there. Especially, like, the first time you're watching it. No, right? like, if I like, there's a lot of movies, especially more modern, not even more modern, like, movies made in the last, like, 40-odd years, where it's just, like, for the most part, I can yeah. watch those at any time. I would say the, the dividing line is, like, at a certain point in the 70s. Yeah. Usually. Um, but... Yeah, anything before that, I need to be in a certain mindset in order to watch. Um, I would advise going into this movie with that, but I guess we can... It's going to pay that off because it's not a type of movie that's an old movie that will feel like you really are going to, I don't know, have to work to engage with it on a basic level. Yeah, to expand it, on that, I yeah. can get into my very, very brief history. <laughs> well, hold on one second. Okay. I will say that even though I... I was a huge fan of this movie and I remain a big fan. Um, it has been supplanted as my favorite movie by this director. He, uh, he made a number of really awesome movies like Lake Orbeau, the wages of fear and K. K de Orfev. I don't know how to say that one, I but that one's also to good. any of our hypothetical French listeners. Yeah. Our imaginary French listeners because France doesn't exist. It's imaginary. That's what I meant. Um, France is a conspiracy by the <laughs> globalists. Flat Earth, yeah. France, giraffes. <laughs> exactly. None of them are real people. Oh my God. Have you Wake seen up, sheeple. Have you seen that Twitter account that's like birds aren't real? Birds are all just government. Yeah, government spy drones. Exactly. <laughs> During the government shutdown. Why I do you think Hitchcock made the birds? Exactly. He sent a bird to the moon landing with yeah. Stanley Kubrick. <laughs> exactly. But anyway, what the fuck are we talking about? <laughs> but uh, yeah, I guess my opinion of this one as his, my favorite of his has changed a little bit. It's probably my third now behind Lake Corbeau and Wages of Fear. Late Wages of Fear is also amazing. But point is, this director is a really fantastic director. I advise you to check out his movies. His name is Henri Georges Clouseau. Um, and uh, yeah, it, I think this movie is a good way to enter into his, uh, his filmography. And uh, you'll find lots of similarities between his other movies. Very good with making thrillers and really hates institutions. And uh, I was really looking forward to watching this movie this week because it is a very interesting experience, and I was very eager to see 
how Max would respond to this. Even though I sort of um, artificially just this would happen inevitably, right? I guess I artificially mediated your experience of this movie uh, by saying, listen to me, I can't avoid you from having a certain expectation now, but don't look up stuff about this movie beforehand. And immediately when you say that to somebody, you just a little bit open the door a crack and they understand an yeah. idea of what this movie might be. But M. Night Shyamalan appears in right. your subconscious. And just right. Goes, what a twist. Yeah. So that was a little bit unavoidable. But for the most part, you had a genuine experience with this movie. Okay. Should I talk about it? Yeah. Uh, okay. So. Actually, no. Well, Actually, so, yeah. Well, thank you for the yeah. Spectator Film Podcast. <laughs> it's over again. Um, but yeah, so I have to disagree with you though. Um, this is my least favorite film by this director cause it's the only film I've seen. Oh, um, dang. No, no, but it's also my favorite, but, uh, no, I have no history with this director. I've literally never heard of him before. I'm not going to pretend like I do. There are some films that Austin suggests that I've literally never heard of. Well, you've before. heard of Inspector Clouseau. Yes, I have. Um, who is not this man and not related to it. Yes. Oh, thank you for bringing that up. That was valuable discussion. Um, you got it. But yeah, so Austin suggested this and my first thought was my stereotypical Max thought whenever Austin suggests a black and white movie from over 60 years ago, um, which is, okay, I'm going to need to do some research. I'm going to need to find some context for this. I might enjoy it. It's not going to be one of my favorite things we've done on the podcast, but it's going to be another week and we'll keep on going. But I'll gain some artsy knowledge from it and I'll gain an appreciation for the director. And if I don't like it, then whatever, I'll move on with my life. And then I'm just like, okay, I have a little bit of time. Let's start some research. And Austin messaged me. He's like, oh yeah, by the way, don't look into this movie. And I'm just like, Ooh, oh, oh, that's the exact opposite of what normally I have to. Oh, okay. So it's probably, there's probably some sort of twist or it's like, it was either in my mind, there was two things. It was either going to be like a twist ending that like every review of it would talk about. So I couldn't right. look it up or it was going to be like a very controversial film for the time. And I thought there was going to be like something shocking that you thought it was going to be like sallow. Like, so, yeah, something like that <laughs> where it's just like, it goes from being one thing to just like really shocking, like other like hard genre switch Has, hashtag sallow surprise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, and with a title that literally translates to like devils, like, yeah. Okay. So I was kind of excited by that and I started watching it. I'm like, yeah, okay. I'm definitely getting Hitchcock vibes off of this, but I really liked this movie. Like, yeah, it's been, I, I don't know how long it's been since an old black and white movie ha literally had me for the good portion of it on the edge of my seat. Just being like, Oh my God, what's going to happen next? Um, I would recommend you check out Wages of Fear next. Uh, maybe I will. Talk about being on the edge of your seat, man. Wow. But I, I really enjoyed this. Um, I was interested to... We'll get into this more of the filming because... Austin, I don't really disagree with, on this because I've kind of come around to Austin's way of thinking. But it was interesting because I was picking up... Uh, my, my gaydar was going off. My, my homosexual senses were tingling. Um, How does the gaydar sound, Max? Uh, boop. No, it's just gay, gay, <laughs> gay. Um, no, I'm, I'm I'm bisexual, so my gaydar is actually not that efficient. Um, although from all of my purely gay friends, the their yeah correct terminology for gaydar is hopefully wishing. Um, but I I was getting some homoerotic, not homoerotic, but like homosexual vibes in this movie, which interestingly enough, I didn't know it was based on a book where there actually is a homosexual relationship. Yeah. In it. And also it was a weird experience throughout the movie where you're like, this seems gay and you're talking about this and this and like Max, <sighs> I know you think this and I understand why. And I'm not going to tell you why I'm saying, hold on to your horses here. Yeah. But trust me, it's a little bit undecided maybe. Yeah. But th the skeleton of gayness is still very much in this movie. And <laughs> that's a band name. <laughs> Yeah. 
catch out my yeah catch my show with skeletons my, of gayness yes the my my local punk rock band um, yeah there you go okay cool i don't need to need to do this podcast anymore i'm gonna go start fuck this i'm out of here starting an all lgbt i've punk moved rock on band. to greener pastures yeah specifically the skeletons of gayness <laughs> yeah. um so that was interesting to me the whole murder mystery premise to me which normally i kind of get sick of those genre pieces pretty quickly. Right. Um, it was done in a very interesting and unique way where I enjoyed it thoroughly. The two lead actresses really carry this movie, I think, because like you have the very Hitchcockian thing, as we mentioned yesterday, where like most of the side characters are just very one note. Like this is what I do and this is how yeah, I act. They're, they're broad. Um, but the two leads show a varying range of emotion where like, you have the stone cold mistress who's orchestrating this murder. And then you have like the nervous wife with a heart condition. Who's not sure about doing it and overly emotional. And they slowly begin to switch or crack, but not really. And it's, I liked it. I liked the character yeah. development. I liked the constantly sh- yeah, changing tone of it. I, I was, I really, really liked this movie. Austin. It yeah. might be my favorite movie that not your favorite, meh, my favorite pick of yours, but my favorite, favorite that like you've introduced me to like, oh yeah, you mean yeah. like a new movie that we yeah. watched i'm trying to think of the other ones that we've we've Mi- we've done that would have been like that though ministry of fear lamillion um lamillion you were on the edge of your seat but for a different reason you were gen you were probably more discom- you were like uncomfortable uh, in that i was movie. sweating and wanted to leave because <laughs> i'm just like it's uh, in your pocket yeah but uh but yeah i can't i don't remember a lot of other ones we've done Tokyo Drifter. You like Tokyo Drifter. I did. Um, I did like Tokyo Drifter, but like it was more of a cinematic appreciation rather than just like, I am so emotionally involved in this right now. <laughs> so there's not a lot of emotions in that movie to be fair. Yeah. To be or not to be pretty good though. I'm, I I didn't mean this as a personal attack. I'm just saying that like this particularly. Struck. Well, I feel offended. Okay. So good. you better come up with some sort of apology right now. Dear Austin, go fuck yourself. <laughs> okay. Sincerely, right. Max. Um, Thank you. But yeah. So yeah, I don't, I don't have a history of this movie. This isn't like one of those things where it's even like, oh, I had peripheral knowledge of this movie through like clips of other things or yeah. whatnot. Did it get you it, at it, the end? Um, honestly, like I found the buildup more satisfying than the release almost. Um, right. But I, I like the ending. Um, but I'm not going to spoil anything more, but or I guess we're already in. He's still alive. Spoilers. Yeah. Spoil- oh, my God. Okay. The, yeah. The husband is still alive and he's orchestrated this entire thing with the mistress. Right. Um, I would have liked it more if they didn't immediately go to jail <laughs> five seconds after that reveal. It's a little bit hurried up. The fact that if you do the math, I think the elongated sequence of Vera Clouseau running around the institution is I think seven minutes long. Yeah. And then over the course of two minutes, you get the reveal and then explanation and then movie over after that. Yeah. It's it's two minutes. Um, I think if like you, if you had more time of them, like savoring the fact that they finally gotten away with this long convoluted murder scheme. Um, and then like, just like have them like the next day, like the inspector yeah, show maybe. up and just be like, Oh, okay. We've, you know, at least some psychiatrist doesn't come and explain it to your face. No, it doesn't pull a psycho where it's just like, well, we have to end the movie this way now. But yeah. like, but you know, I want revelry in the accomplishment of the plot before like it's snatched away from them. I want them to fully indulge in their yeah. plot before the movie takes it away. But from I us. kind of appreciate that about it too. It's a little bit unraveled at the end but you know i think i'm not saying it as a major detriment i'm just saying no if i wanted to make this absolutely perfect for me like that's i I would elongate the end yearn for something there yeah yeah no i understand that i i do think though that the the highlight of this movie because we'll talk about this during the commentary track itself but the plotting is preposterous yeah (laughs) and the characters even though they are very they're very broad even though they are very well drawn so the psychological complexity of some of these characters is not necessarily the draw for the movie. The draw is the scenario and the suspense that you get from the scenario and how well directed this movie is. This movie is so well directed. Yes. Um, and it carries you through the movie. I know 
maybe because we were commenting on it a little bit throughout, as we usually do during our prep screenings. Although the preposterousness comes to light a little bit more. Although but, it was interesting, I think for the first time, because I talk a lot during our pre screenings, um, right. either it's just quips or just being like, oh, I like this, or it's just like things like that. He I comes talk, up with drafts for all the jokes he's going to make. Not really, honestly, but like, um, sure. I kind of sure. feel silent for a good portion of this movie and you kept talking and I'm just like, okay, you, you, you do. You. Well, I kept trying to check in like, yeah. What do you think about that? What but do you think no, about that? Uh, isn't I was that getting, weird? I was getting too absorbed in the <laughs> world of the movie to yeah. more. And I do have that problem sometimes when we're watching it, whereas a movie, if I love, I'll like stop commentating during the track and just be like, Oh, I like this. Oh wait, I'm doing a podcast. <laughs> and then I, I have to tase you. Yeah. Um, well you have that stun gun for a reason. So exactly. <laughs> it's a podcast. Putting it tool. to use. Finally. Um, I've got it right next to the mixer. But yeah, I fell silent during a lot of this because I'm just like, ooh, what's going to happen next? What's yeah. going to happen next? It's, it's very much a movie that, um, because of the strength of the direction and the scenario, I think it has a slightly timeless quality because it goes to the point where it's aff- affective with an A. Yeah. You know, It becomes something that, even more so sometimes, than the movie itself. It's the experience of watching the movie that becomes like a draw for people to revisit it. You know, this is a movie much like other twist movies where you're like, like the sixth sense. You'd be curious to watch it with somebody who doesn't know anything about it. Yeah. Right. And you're going to be like, Oh, I'm going to savor this experience of watching it more so than actually the movie itself. And that's always a very interesting experience well, when you yeah, find it. That's so more watching your friend watch the movie than it. <laughs> But it's still engaging with the movie. No, it is. So, and I love it. Um, yeah. So that is, uh, there's a lot to jump into about that, but that's pretty much our experience with it in a nutshell. So are you ready to, to jump into this movie like a tub of water? I was going to say jump into the movie, just like jumping into the pool. Like a skin diver? Yes. Like a champion <laughs> skin diver? Whatever the fuck that means. <laughs> that's actually, it's a, it's a euphemism, but we won't get into that. Oh now. God. Oh God. Okay. <laughs> God. Let's jump in. Like a skin diver. Welcome Ooh. to Lady Abelique. Now, Max, we didn't say this, but we're recording this on the Ides of March, so after this movie is over, I'm going to kill you by giving you a heart attack. How do you feel? Yeah. I've well, had, that's exactly how I thought you'd feel. I, I've had it coming for a while, and that <laughs> was going to be... Going to send you to Juno after. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes. Uh, we should also mention we are watching the Criterion version of this movie. We, so we get the little Criterion shit at the beginning. Yeah, and surprisingly, as subtitles, because it's in a language other than English, because... I never realized that about Criterion, but they never have subtitles. Hashtag it's in a non-English Criterion language. hates the hearingly impaired. I'm going to keep... Keep using a non-existent phrase. Yeah, yeah. No, that hearingly impaired is a completely valid phrase. Actually, hearingly impaired. Yes. Okay. Well, anyway, so you were asking about the title. Yes, and why it's Lady Abelique. He took that title from an old 19th century book for no particular reason, apparently, just because he liked the book and he thought it was a salacious title. They're originally going to call it The Widows, which also doesn't seem to to really apply because only one of them is a widow, but that, that, you know, I, that's I kind of like that though. That, that works for the premise. But of the you movie. understand how that's maybe a little bit harder to market than Lady Abelique. Oh yeah. Well that, that's a catching title. I was yeah talking about how like, um, slightly before it started, I was talking about how we don't have, we don't have a uh, good, yeah, good old fashioned devil worship movies anymore. No, it's always has to be something else. It's like, you know what? No, I want. I, sometimes I just want a movie where a satanic cult summons a, like actual demon and things happen. Yeah. Just, you know what else was interesting about this though? Even though this is not, as that, you say, a devil a devil worshiping movie, is yeah. that you were humorously keyed into what this movie was doing, where you immediately started trying to speculate on what this image of the water would be a metaphor yeah. for as an image. And you were quite close. Do you remember what she said? I believe I said that just like, oh, this water is filthy and it's a metaphor for the filth of humanity. Uh, kind of. Yeah. I mean, really, we're going to talk about this throughout the movie, but I feel like if there is any subtext to this film, it's like the idea that you can't grasp other people internally 
and that trying to do so is like trying to look through that murky water. Everybody's just impenetrable yeah. and evil. <laughs> you might be able to get some gleam of something, yeah. but it's... everyone else is a mercenary and you come second. You don't no, trust anybody but yourself. Yeah. Ultimately the subtext of this movie is pessimism and, uh, and small trucks. But yeah, and even there's a quote from that book that he took the title from right at the beginning, but it doesn't really amount to anything and has not a lot to do with what happens in this movie. But yeah, I guess it's probably a good time to just launch into that and say, even though this movie is a masterful example of the thriller genre, and uh, really, as far as I can tell, like one of the earliest in- instances of like a twist movie, yes. more specifically than a mystery movie, I kind of feel like it amounts to a bit of a genre exercise and that it does not have a lot of really substantial subtext to it. Uh, I think it's a little bit shallow in that way, which is not necessarily to devalue its effectiveness or what it is. It's just what does it really amount to? And what it amounts to at the end is just the little ballyhoo, you know? Um, Um, I was going to say I was prepared well, cuz you said that when I brought up the thing about the water yeah. yesterday and you're just like just just be prepared that there's not like a whole lot of subtext in this movie and I was prepared to fight you on that um just seems like oh I'm going to find some good shit but no I I have to agree with you yeah that this movie is almost all about the text and focusing on that yeah um but but what it does... thats Yeah, that's not a bad thing. And what we mean by text is just the way it plays with this idea of perspective and narration yeah. is so engaging on its own. That that's why you revisit the movie. You revisit it because it's so skillfully directed despite not really necessarily suggesting a whole lot about the psychology of its characters or their situation in life. You know, yeah. does this really say anything about the institution these, these characters live in or the country they, they're part of? Or even like the or class or gender the morality of the relationships that they're in or something like that. No, yeah. not really. Even though people would say that the novel is often, you know, people talk about that as being not too much more substantial. You get the idea of um, the gender swap in the novel being more something about. At least that contributes to some idea of like gender roles yeah. more specifically. I haven't read the novel, but I can see that being the case. But in this, it really does not quite as definitively. And this guy's apparently from California because he's going to do like a sun juice cleanse. And yeah. Just sweat out all the toxins naked on vacation. Get those one of those plastic things that you pop on your skin and go, and it removes the toxins that way. Have you seen those? They're the silliest things ever. Was that for like snake bites? No, it's just like... That's what I'd use it for. It's like a plastic thing you put on your skin. It'd be really helpful at work for it me. It suctions on... Oh yeah, Justin is a cobra wrangler. It's... You just call me Justin? What the fuck is wrong with you? Oh, wow, wow. I don't... You gotta go sit in the corner after this. I don't this. even have an excuse for I'm gonna assassinate you for sure after this. Okay, but yeah. Oh. By the way, I just want to mention, this is the one weird scene um, with the lights on them when they're walking down the hallway where it just like looks tinsy and awful, and it makes no sense to me because the cinematographer for this is Armand Terad, I think, who I believe he did the last... I, I believe he did The Passion of Joan of Arc. I could be wrong. But I believe he did that. And he, that's an amazing cinematography, right? And the cinematography in this film is fantastic. Uh, but that one shot is bizarre. Yeah. Also, one thing we talked about in the introduction a little bit is how this movie introduces characters in ways that are akin to maybe Hitchcock. And by that we mean they're broad strokes characters, but they're done, they're well drawn, despite being broad. So we have really good actors um, really nailing the one note that they're given. And then you just have the simple things, right? We know that we know things about these characters from their wardrobe, right? She's innocent. The way she act interacts with the students, she has genuine sympathy for them. We know stuff about these teachers from how they release their students to recess, right? We learn a lot about Simone Signore when she's has them having them march out, right? Yeah. Um, and then the other one is well liked by her students. She gets yes. a gift from by a, of a fan, but she's also vulnerable. Yes, because she has pigtails. You know, she's yes, she's young and innocent. Yes, um, but also, I was thinking about this. This isn't really like it's not important right. per se, but she has a bruise over her eye, and that's why she's wearing sunglasses. And it's supposed to 
It's like, oh, the he's abusing her. Right. And that's obviously the catalyst for like, listen, I'm planning his murder. I need you to go along with it. Um, but that bruise disappears quite quickly. Quite doesn't quickly. It? Is it fake? Is because there's a lot of stuff like that. The movie never movie. comments on that. Yeah, and it, it's really fun to watch the movie a second time and notice that. By the way. I know I mentioned this to you today, but I just have to point it out again because I can't. I know I'm going to call him French Raimi, but this guy looks like a French Ted Raimi. <laughs> kind of, yeah. You mentioned that. I forgot, but yeah. Yeah. I think he gives a fantastic performance as the biggest douchebag of all time. Yeah, you really hate him. You, yeah. You, you definitely sympathize Yeah, sympathize with the ladies and yeah. want to see him dead. Now, at this point in the movie... Oh my God! The garage is opening. Beautiful. The the rumbling of the garage sim- yeah symbolizes the rumbling that's going of on their in hatred her morality. for him. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Good good save. Good uh, save. All right. Also, I was I'm not going to assassinate you now. That was, was a good one. Talk about how he has the stereotypical cigarette holder. The cigarette holder. Something I've always wanted, but I'm always just like, do I do <sighs> I, I really want to look like that much of a douchebag? Yeah. Well, one other interesting thing to mention. Um, about their characters so far is so far she's been discussed in reference to her being from Venezuela twice. And that doesn't really come up for the rest of the movie, but it is interesting if you are going to search for subtext in this film in terms of uh, national identity, that's the closest it comes in that capacity where it's talking about her being a little bit more innocent and uh, I don't know, yeah. less corrupted in association with her being from Caracas, apparently. But again, that movie, the movie drops that thread yeah, pretty no. quickly. That she said, brings up her home country and like how you act there, and then it's sort of never referenced again. But yeah. That said, I think it does play up an interesting idea that we see repeated throughout the entire movie, which I know I talked to you about a little bit yesterday. Um, the idea that, okay, I'm going to talk Some, about it in reference to Mr. Drain, Monsieur Drain, talking to the little boy about, does your educator from uh, Venezuela dress like that as well? And he's like, yes. And he rides up the class on a horse. And he's like, oh my goodness, I can't even imagine <laughs> that. And then he says to Vera Clouseau, he says, well, I just told him that because to please him or whatever. Yeah. It's the idea that people are very trapped in their own perception of the world in this movie. And they're very much like, they're limited by that. Everybody yeah. is caught in their own bubble. You know? Everybody is very much anchored in their own perception of the world and that limits their ability to see reality. And we see that because the, are this couple, right? Yeah. Nicole and Christina, Vera and Simone, they come across lots of people who never really come close to figuring out what they're up to. Even though you think they might also like later on in the movie, once the body disappears, um, we have all sorts of people saying that they've seen the principal, they, but nobody believes them because yeah. you can't because he's dead. It's interesting because it's like, it's like playing off that Hitchcockian idea of performative identity as a way to mine drama, right? Yeah. And it's like, okay, we have to perform as if things are normal, even though we know they're not. And that's how you get drama from a lot of Hitchcock movies. But the weird thing is that even though they feel like there are lots of consequences because he's dead, even if they did genuinely kill him throughout the entire movie, everybody else they encounter treats it as trivial. No yeah. one else cares except for them. It, they may literally give the appearance of caring. And I think it's interesting um, how they introduce all these characters because they do a good job of solidifying the idea that there's already that idea of performative drama present within their character dynamic in the first place. And we, a good example of that is this scene where uh, French Raimi forces Vera Clouseau to eat the rotten fish. Yeah. Because everybody's looking, right? He cares about appearances. That drama is still there, and it still forces them to behave in certain ways, even though it's sometimes just a pretense, right? Yeah. Everybody knows that French Raimi is cheating on Vera Clouseau. Yeah, and that's the thing. Like right. even she does. She's consorting with the mistress, where the guy was talking about that earlier. Yeah. And yet, still we care about appearances, right? Yeah. 
later on he says, oh man, it's disgraceful that I have to hide from my porter. You know, that's still something that creates anxiety for these characters, mostly indirectly for Vera Clouseau, because God forbid this guy feels like discomforted in any way he's going to take it out on her, right? And, and I know, like, it's interesting rewatching this because, like, when the first time you watch it, it's like, why the fuck is he doing this? Like, right. Other than just to be a controlling asshole, like, there's no reason. It's just like, no, cause her the most amount of stress possible because the closer she gets to having her heart fail, the closer I get to achieving my goal. Yeah. And uh, that's the retroactive answer. But I think the first time you're watching it, the actor does a really good job of balancing the cartoonish villainy that this could yeah. be, you know? Um, and I think the movie does a great job of selling these characters and their motivations because if it didn't, then it would just be very blatantly obvious how, how preposterous all of this is, <laughs> you know? I think that's why it was a really good decision to only have the soundtrack, the musical score come in, at, I think mostly at the beginning and the end. Yeah. I don't know if there are any other cues. I, was, I can't remember them. I was talking about that with you because you were talking about how this movie is very Hitchcockian and I was sort of like... There's no music though. The most most right. of the movie has no score. So, and Hitchcock is famous for using music to influence the mood of his movies. He's but. so famous that the one time he didn't use it is super famous. Yeah, yeah. But in Birdemic, <sighs> yes, my favorite Hitchcock film. Birdemic is like one of those movies that I'm like, I have a hard time believing that it was made for real. Like, you think it was a joke? Kind of, because like people are just like, oh well, it's like you can tell it's real because it has like the phoned-in environmental message. But I'm like, that almost seems like somebody who's like making fun of it to a degree. It's just like, oh look, the shitty movie and the people who made it have like these environmental views, so it must be shitty as well. But I don't know. I I might be reaching. Can there. I sidetrack your birdemic discussion real yeah. quick? The, uh, sorry, spoiler for the next podcast. Right. So. Interesting moment there, right? This is probably a good time to point up, point out how frequently this is used as like a case study for staging. Uh, there are clues littered throughout the movie in terms of how Clouseau directs things and how it's edited and how it's staged that inform you of all the character allegiances right from the beginning. Yeah. And this is an example used by a lot of people where if you see that shot, right, staging, there's a triangle between all three of them before... Simone Signore walks over, right? And they're on the same plane. Vera Clouseau is on a different plane. There's lots of subtle things like that. There's subtle things where they will be shown, both of them, and by that I mean Remy and Simone Signore, in the same shot. And Vera Clouseau, they'll cut away to show her by herself. Yes. It's simple things like this that give people like little Easter eggs to go back and find after the fact. It is fun. Yeah. What is not fun is this scene. And I also think this is a moment where not having the score contributes a lot to it being palatable now. Yeah. I know we've talked a lot about our frustration with movies that use rape as a character motivation because we find it often to be very lazy and exploitative. And it's in the vein of laziness. It's just like it's a misogynistic assumption. Like I see this a lot in a lot of quote unquote female empowerment films where it's just like, oh, she gets raped and that's the thing that like drives her to take matters into her own hands and right. fucking like even movies I like or series I like do yeah, fall into that trope and it is very uncomfortable and problematic. But like, I don't know how I feel about it here because it's shown off screen. It's not used in the most atrocious way to try to like this movie wouldn't do that. But like, it's not like titillating or graphic. Yeah. It's not yeah. the titillating kind, which all rape is bad, but if you're using it in your filmmaking as an excuse to get tits and ass in your movie, then holy crap, you need to reconsider your morality and your decision to become a filmmaker. But there are in, better, more fun yeah. ways. Just make porn. Yeah. Just go into porn. <laughs> it's so much more profitable. Why not? You can make so much more money doing that than yeah. making bad B movies. Um, Maybe they think they're making porn for somebody. <laughs> Everything is porn for somebody. <laughs> people people who have attention fetish will fucking jerk off to this movie all day long. <laughs> oh god, I'm like can't even believe what's happening. Oh man. I don't want to think I don't want those listeners. But don't kink shame people. <laughs> but uh there's that, but 
I don't know how I feel about this because... Well, we had an interesting conversation about I, it. I don't... Here's the thing. Here's where I've arrived at. I don't think it's necessary, though. Like, we've already established him as a controlling, abusive monster. Right. Um, and while you can say that, like, oh, that's the final straw. That's what makes her decide. Like, it's almost implied that, like, the way she reacts to it. Like, yeah, she's saying no, no. But, like, it's sort of like this has happened before. Well, that was the interesting thing. Yeah. Clearly, I think you can imply from the way he treats her in general that yeah. it's happened before. Right? And what do you think he did to... What do you think they're implying he did to Simone Signore after he fucking punched her in the eye? Yeah. Right? What? Why do you think it happened at 4 a.m.? So I think the thing that's weird about it for me, though, is that there's maybe a mis, misconception of what constitutes rape, maybe at this time. And I know that French culture is very different from the U.S. culture in terms of, you know, the idea and conception of sex. Um, so it's maybe hard to tell and speculate about that from a movie from France from the fifties. But my sort of thinking and attitude towards that scene is that it understands that it's a very bad thing. I don't think it really would conceive of that moment as a rape, but merely like a bad type of unwanted sex sex, you know, like I think it's obviously wrong to differentiate between those two things, but I think this movie kind of does that. I don't know. It just comes and it goes, you know? It's not. It's kind of weird that it just comes and it goes. Um, No, it's not. But it's not the worst. um, But but rewatching it, I have to question if it was was necessary or you could have left it in the implied. Right. Um, Especially since, uh, like, I guess it kind of like makes you retroactively hate the mistress more because, like, she's fully aware that he's doing this and right. then stills just like, Oh yeah, let's do this really, really, really long elaborate drawn out plot to kill your wife. Right. When she probably would have died in another month anyway. Well, you have to hate her yeah. to begin with, because here's the thing. Actually, that's interesting to point out that definitely if you're talking about the preposterousness of this plot, yeah, it would have happened anyway, probably if that's the way they're treating her. Yeah, like every doctor like that comes in is just like, well, it was bound to happen eventually. Like, yeah, this is going to be a thing. And she mentions that like they've had that conversation before. Oh, it's not. Yeah, she mentions it in this scene. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's interesting though because, God, I I didn't even like they could have totally just not done any of this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but the thing that's interesting about that is the degree to which this movie kind of abstracts the kind of Hitchcockian tendency to put women in very perilous, perilous positions, and then the movie is like a protracted sequence for like ninety minutes of them like suffering through this ordeal, and there's a type of weird sadism to that that makes people often uncomfortable about Hitchcock's movies now, yeah. and this movie is way more dramatic version of that than I think Hitchcock ever accomplished. Like the idea that they're literally, this movie is like, how long is this movie? 90 minutes. So a right. Little, a little longer, but yeah, yeah it might be just it's like 90 time. minutes of them torturing this woman to death slowly. Yeah. That's all this movie is. And that's kind of weird to think about. And then it happens in the movies. It's like, okay, done by it's okay. I wasn't going to bring this up immediately, but okay, this can, movie is like, it's 90 minutes of that. And then you wonder what the point of it was. And the point is don't tell your friends, blah, blah, blah. It's like, wow, we just watched her die for like a Ballyhoo William Castle <laughs> yeah, thing. Kind of. You know, it's kind of strange that that is ultimately what the subtext amounts to. And it, it kind of makes me feel a little bit uncomfortable in terms of just why you would treat a character this way for 90 minutes and have it be such a sadistic game that they're in. And then it's just like, don't tell your friends. And it's just kind of like a, it amounts to like a parlor gag almost. Kind of. I I wouldn't go that far. I kind of, there's more, yeah. there's more to it than that. Yeah. I I, well, yeah, there, certainly there is. I mean, I'm, I guess I'm being over a little bit hyperbolic to make my point, but yeah. it that is a weird feeling I have watching it. I love how massive this fucking, <laughs> this w- wicker basket is. Also, I love, we're going to be introduced to World War II Henry over here, whatever his name is. Um, yeah. 
the husband. Mr. Quiz Show. Yeah. Um, but he, I love how he's like, oh, I'm so inconvenienced when she hasn't met, she apparently hasn't been back for like almost a year. Like, right. She's never around. She's like an absentee landlord almost. Like, she just like shows Are up. Are you saying that she's a sadist? No. She's a tight ass? Kind she's a sadist? Kind of, but like. Worship that, Max? Never. Anyway, what I was trying to say was, like, he's so inconvenienced by the fact that, like, she shows up for one day. Yeah. Listens to the radio with them for a brief period of time and then takes a bath at night. Yeah. And he's so, so angry about it. It's the end of the world. Sky is falling. (laughs) Yeah. Well, let's talk about that. Where does she come from? How does she have this house? Is it her family's house? She's renting it to them. It's interesting to watch this movie again and look at different character details like this, which might seem random. The fact that she just owns this house, right? But also it hints at this idea that like it contributes to the murkiness of characters. You can say that the character motivations and everything are preposterous, but I think it really like contributes to this idea of like murky morality and also murky transparency into how another person's mind actually works and who they really are. That's the real thing I I get out of this movie emotionally is like this overriding pessimistic sense that you can never truly know another person. How did she get this house? How much money does she have? You know, why is she doing she, everybody is a mercenary looking out for themselves and they're brutal about it. And it's really pessimistic. (laughs) And that's really something that you find, I think, in most of Clouseau's movies, especially Le Corbeau, maybe the most dramatic example of that, where the premise of the movie is just that this town is ripping itself apart after a newspaper starts publishing poison pen letters that it's getting, and everybody just starts accusing one another, who (laughs) knows this, and then they just rip themselves apart. It's pretty amazing to watch. I'd have to see. Yeah. Yeah. There's so many like variables that could have gone wrong. What if like she's empowered by this and like she genuinely goes to find a divorce lawyer <laughs> right now? Right. Like their their plan hinges on so many variables. Yeah. Well, again, I think the thing that really saves it is again how well directed it is and the realist aesthetic no, of it. Me picking it apart is like it's dumb and silly. Like it's not me criticizing the movie. It's just sort of like no. after having already enjoyed the film. And no, but I think it's worth it to bring that up because I think it helps you recognize how this movie works well, how much of a like well-designed motor it is. Yeah. Because you don't really think about that the first time you're watching it. You know, obviously for you, it's a little bit different because we're going back and forth a little. Yeah. But you don't really think about that. You're well absorbed into this scenario. And the movie is so well executed in that regard that you're like, there's something here to really look at and uh, learn from. And I think, uh, you know, the thing, the point we were moving towards in terms of this movie, not really using music is that it sort of absorbs you into a reality of this world. And you start taking what you're seeing for granted. Yeah. Which is why the trick at the end is so explosive because you feel like you've been watching something that's realist you know, and you're, you feel like you're watching the ontology of what's happening and not the epistemology. Oh, it's your main. Mm. I think it's funny that he almost looks directly at the camera mm. when he does that. Can't win them all. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, come on, Ted Raimi. You're better than that. <laughs> Interestingly enough, that's one of the few scenes of uh, unrestricted narration is that moment. People like to turn that out, uh, point that out. I think it comes at right the perfect time. Just be like, yep, we're confirming he's on his way. He's a douchebag as usual. Besides from mistresses, like, at, like the actual actresses acting, like her character's acting is very well. She never even slightly plays her hand at all. Like, Oh, Simone, Simone Signore? Yeah. She's like, she is fully committed to the whole thing of yeah. just like, no, I'm the cold, bitter one who really wants to go along with this. And she feigns concern for her the entire time. Well, it's really interesting to watch after the fact. And you see all the maneuvering she does of yeah. Vera, where she's 
she's taking this out of her hands. She's setting it up. You know, it becomes this weird passive aggressive thing where at, in, at first you feel like it's support and cooperation. And Simone Senior Ray just delivers such a strong performance. And by strong, I mean like it's defined effortlessly, you know, in her character, where she just she moves in a certain way. She she's taking action all the time in everything she does. Yeah. Right. And you feel like she's just such a reliable character in that sense that you're taking everything she does for granted. She seems like a bedrock that you can trust. Yeah. Because and it's all the performance. And uh, I think it's really perfect casting. Um, Simone Signore, I think, is just a really fantastic a- actor in general. She's been in a lot of really good movies. Uh, she, I think, became popular with a movie called Cascador, uh, directed by Jacques Becker, which I have not seen, but I own on iTunes, I think. I've been meaning to get around to that one. But she's known for a type of minimalist style and, uh, you know, kind of like blunt, matter-of-fact performances. And I feel like okay. that's a really good use of her in this movie. Oh, definitely. Because it, the matter-of-factness sells the fact that what you're watching is really happening. <laughs> also interesting detail to point out. She just mentioned that she's never had whiskey and that was weird to me watching it because it's like, I think she, I think she meant she never had that particular brand because it's supposed to be cheapo whiskey that they bought specifically for this purpose. Well, I looked into it. Okay. It turns out whiskey in France was just expensive at this time in general, I think. And there's a weird implication that she is sort of mercenary and comes from not a lot of money. And that's probably also a good time to mention that, This movie, there's lots of lines of dialogue about money in this movie. The cost of things. Yeah. When we arrive here. I mean, aside from just French Ramey being a miser in general and buying rotten fish, that's literally the first thing he says, right? You're not paying for this. Why do you care that it's rotten? Um, And then the fact that it's all about Vera Clouseau's money is this entire scam. People want the money. Um, He is angry at her because he purchased, she purchased the school because she wanted to teach children and be around children. And he's like, but wait, this won't make us money. Right. Yeah. That's where the animosity can be traced to. Apparently clearly Simone senior Ray is, uh, interested in being involved in this plot partially because of the money, right? Everything is about money, 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 money. And, uh, clearly that has to do a lot with, you know, Cluzo's just general distrust of uh, institutions. Yeah, you could say that. Well, this is also a post World War II France, which yeah. is like a lot. Of, uh, some people might not know this, but the U.S. after World War II spent a lot of money in rebuilding Europe. Primarily, not just out of the goodness of our hearts, obviously, right? But because socialism was taking up root in a lot of France because there was widespread ruin, widespread poverty, and not a lot to eat. And people started being like, hey, as is French tradition, when the masses don't have a lot to eat and the people on top still look like they're doing just fine. Get your knives. Get your guillotines, everybody. (laughs) So I'm sure that sentiment was very much in the water at the time. Well, there was a lot of... uh, there's, that's an interesting conversation in terms of this movie historically and its yeah. appraisal of it where uh, a, a lot of people looked at it as like an entertainment movie that was kind of felt like they had been cheated because they're like, but this is so well made, but it's kind of shallow. So yeah. a lot of people came down on it very hard because of that. And uh, if you look at the French New Wave critics, people like Francois Truffaut, they just outright rejected this movie because they saw it as a movie made by the old guard of France. Yeah. And they're like, this is not aesthetically speaking to the moment we're in politically. Um, and obviously they would be very involved in, especially Godard in the politics of what was going on in France throughout the sixties leading up to the May 68 riots. Yeah. Um, but Clouseau was very much the old guard. And because of that, I think this movie, even though it was a big commercial success, both in France and internationally, this was a movie that I think was popular to, dunk on you know and he was popular to dunk on in general throughout this time so it's interesting to see how like that critical like revival has happened after the fact i 
at least in America, where people yeah. really seem to appreciate this movie, perhaps even more so. And it's worth noting that people are like, they have a point when they say this movie is kind of like a genre exercise. And that doesn't have to devalue how no, effective not at it all. is. But yeah, I think it's interesting to look at this movie within its historical context like that. As is as are most films. Some films are timeless and you don't need to... It, timeless in the sense where you don't really... Like the context of when they were made doesn't play too much into it. Yeah. But this movie... I think is definitely worth as are most movies. I would say it's a rare occasion when you can find a movie that wasn't relevant, but dun, 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 but it's interesting. Look at the lighting in this scene. It's so wonderful. Yeah, it's great. The lighting is excellent throughout this. And it's interesting. You bring that up right after we get that really low key sort of contrasty image of him walking down the cobblestone towards the actual door, which seems yeah. like a visually, it seems to echo what will happen later when he's stalking around the, the school right before she's killed. But yeah, the cinematography in this movie is just generally fantastic. And there's lots of the other thing that I think reminds me of Hitchcock is there's lots of economy in this, you know, um, he sets up images to achieve like a very particular staging effect all the time. And he just keeps it lean and focused, you know? And I think that that type of approach is what makes it a really effective genre movie and why it remains like very easily accessible as a genre movie it allows you to really sort of focus on uh the key bits of storytelling and it becomes the thing he uses to like distract you with one hand while another thing is happening yeah although like i'm not sure how like badly this movie would have been had to be directed because like you're rightly praising the direction of this movie as one of its many strengths. But I'm trying to think like, so you have this script, right? Right. Um, with the same basic premise, how would you have to direct this movie to give it away? Hmm. I don't know. It's also hard to say because there's been remakes of this movie, multiple remakes. I was going to say this movie seems like something that like would be prone to easily be remade. Right. Uh, I think most notably there was a remake, uh, an American remake in 1996 with Isabel Johnny and uh, Sharon Stone. And that one is loathed universally. People hate that movie. I haven't seen it. I love Isabel Johnny, uh, but people hate that movie. So I don't know. Maybe if you watch that one, you would find your answer. I also think they fucked around with the ending in that one. Uh, so I don't know what changes they made, but um, I'd love to see like, a modern remake of this movie. I would be interested with, to see them adapt the actual book. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. That's exactly where I was going. Like, I, I think the moment might be right for that where it would be enjoyed by yeah. a lot of people. Well, I just think like, I don't know if it's so much of a moment thing so much as like, I would be curious to see that just in general. And maybe the moment for it is the Although moment that this movie, the moment might have even passed though, because like with the book written so long ago, you could see that as almost like, uh, a villainizing of queer people now where it's just like, Oh, you have the, the dastardly secret evil lesbians that are trying to murder this poor man with a heart condition. It becomes but, a paranoia thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's an interesting point. I guess it depends on your approach. Like so yeah. many other things in filmmaking, it's hard to, it's, I think it's hard for us to arrive at clear conclusions about different, like creative decisions at large often. And I think that's a good that's good that that happens because it's hard to say that this doesn't work universally. Yeah. You know, there are very few things that you can be like, now I'm trying to create this movie in my head. And also, um, even in with, within the LGBT community, um, I've experienced this firsthand. So I actually feel comfortable talking about it. Sure. Uh, there's a lot of biphobia even in the community because there's a very small subject in that don't think by few people should be allowed in the queer community at all because they they can pass as straight. They, they can adapt to the, the normal straight society, so they don't need these protections that we built up for ourselves. That's weird. It is. Um, and there are some gay men who won't date uh, bi people and consider, like, they're just like, oh, well, they're, they're going to toy with my emotions and they're going to go back to women, um, something that I've personally experienced. But... That's another way you could take this where even if like you made a wonderful LGBT like or at least an LG friendly version of this, like you could 
even in the gay community, reincite the fears of just like, oh, bi people are trying to toy with you and then are going to betray you in the end. It's that would be a really interesting way to take this movie to actually make it about that experience yeah. as a bi person, though. If these characters, if you explore more of a, the potential for like these characters being bisexual and you have this ghost of the man who, you yeah. know, like I would be more curious in that story, though, what you are saying now, take it in that way. That would be yeah. interesting. Yeah. But that's shocking. Well, not, I guess not some people are just shitty in general. Right. Yeah. But like, it's strange for me to think that because it's like the, the idea of like vilifying people who can quote unquote pass like makes more sense to me along like a racial line because that like, can a gay person not pass for straight? That's not a visible not, trait. Not in their, <laughs> well, not in their love life. Like sure. Gay people, even, even in the day and age where it is more acceptable to be openly gay than it has been in past decades. Of course. Um, even in that time, like in this time, you can see obnoxious straight couples making out in public constantly. Right. You will very rarely see gay people show that level of affection in public for fear of discrimination and retaliation. Right. It's still deeply ingrained in people. So the fact that bi people get that privilege or things like that, equivalent, not like just specifically that, but like the ability to be openly affectionate with your partner and to be presumed straight. Like if you're in, a relationship with the opposite sex, people won't normally be like, oh, well, you're a different sexuality. They'll yeah. say you're straight and right. you'll get all the privilege that comes along with that. And as a bi person, I acknowledge that. Um, but it still is an issue. Um, and I don't know. It's Well, that's definitely a direction you could take this movie in, though. Yeah. I, I, I would love to see a talented director queer up this movie. Um, Todd and, Haynes. <laughs> Todd Haynes is good at taking old, well, this is not a Hollywood movie, but he's yeah. very good at taking like those types of, you know, older classical movie stories and then redoing them in an interesting way. He's got his Far From Heaven in there. He's got his Carol in there. He's got his, well, Carol isn't, well, it's a, I think it's a Patricia Highsmith book. Yeah. It's an older book, but Patricia Highsmith, heaven. obviously writer who is very much you know, somebody who told stories about queer characters. Um, but also like you've got your, uh, Mildred Pierce in there, Todd Haynes, man, Todd Haynes, go after Lady Abelik. I'm all for it. I would <sighs> stop looking at me with your insane eyes, Max. Yeah. How dare you do that? I'm actually, there's a, I'm very excited to, well, I know this movie came out in Europe a little while ago, but it's finally getting its U.S. release soon, which is Knife Plus Heart. I showed you a brief clip of that. Is it that like Jalo the French, type of movie? The French queer porno chic Jalo movie. Um, I, I'm very excited to see that. Yeah, I think when you showed me the trailer, it was like a weird moment of being like, yeah, I'm surprised that like people have not been telling more like queer types of stories while yeah. recruiting elements of the Jalo genre in general because it is it seems to be so much something that's ready to tell that type of story there's so much about sexuality to begin with in the giallo genre that yeah like, why not expand that into yeah why would you not take those elements to express something about like queerness but yeah that could be a really interesting movie sure uh av club apparently loved it so I'll, av club I'll, that's a good website i'm gonna give it a chance just pouring out that whiskey I guess it's contaminated. I guess you can't yeah. drink that. Well, it, it's not, but she doesn't know that. There's no actual poison. Well, it's it. not poison, just putting him to sleep. Well, they I don't want to poison poison him, Max. They just want him to be like he well, got drunk. It's, it's not actually there, though. Like, we have to assume that he's not actually being but Yeah, that's true, right? Yeah. Because he walks out of the bath at a certain point. Yeah. Yeah, and we're going to see it a lot in this sequence where we see Nicole come in right before she's called. Right. And this yeah. is where you can really start pointing out, like you can look at it before in terms of like visual cues in terms of, uh, Simone Signore's performance and just the staging. Right. But here's where you see actual character actions where she's like, Oh, she's pulling off the double plot already. Yeah. And you know what? I'm going to point it out again. 
I can't believe she just stomped out a fucking cigarette in her own goddamn bathroom. I, I can. Um, Maybe it matters less when you're about to drown a man in your bathtub. But also, you have to take into account several things. This is when, one, it was socially acceptable to smoke indoors. Two... Is it that no longer the case in France? Two, this takes place in France, where smoking is a national pastime. Right. And three, this is, I think, supposed to be portrayed as like a rundown, shitty kind of apartment. So it's like, whatever. I don't care. But Max, they have such amazing statues. Yes. And also, she's the kind of take no shit, I don't give a fuck what other people think of me type of character. So why yeah. not? This is my I mean, place. I'm okay with throwing a cigarette on the ground. That's the that's the real thing. Is that yeah. everything in the, this movie is very lean. And that also includes character stuff. That's always the Hitchcockian approach, right? Is like, we're going to show you what matters. But in paring things down, that does not mean you're losing sophistication. What it does is it actually makes you focus on a different part of the movie and it allows you to be manipulated, yeah. right? Which is what this movie does. It says we're going to pare things down and we're going to show you what's happening, but that's not actually what happened. What's happening. It's just, it's so focused on that thing that you focus on that thing. You stop paying attention. Very true. You're much like these people. You get absorbed in the radio. Yeah. I mean, this character is a fantastic example of, of, I think the embodiment of what we were talking about earlier with people being caught in their own world to the degree where they can't see reality in front of them. You know, where these people are right next door. The decline of Rome. <laughs> right. Is the sky is falling because she's interfering with my enjoyment. Of right. This. Yeah. And uh, the idea that his enjoyment is this radio show, this type of entertainment spectacle that's kind of being sold to him in a sense. And he also thinks he's winning money, even and, though he's not. But also there's this thing of like, um, as a viewer who knows this is going to be a murder mystery movie kind of at this point, like, you know, they're going to, they're about to do this murder. This is a red herring. You think that cause he's writing a strongly word letter, noting the exact time yeah. of when this is yeah. going to happen. And you're like, Oh, that's going to come back to bite them in the ass. They fucked up. No, it doesn't matter at all. Don't worry. No. About it. It's just to add more anxiety. Cause and this movie, every, every person they encounter like that, it winds up in retrospect being like this weird black comedic joke where it's yeah. like, oh, you thought you were worried about this the first time. And these people are so fucking wrapped up in their own life. They would never even come close to suspecting that this murder was happening. Drunk soldier man. They like, were never in danger. Yeah. The only thing she was in danger was from was her collaborator. Yeah. Like the only thing that was really in danger was like them finding him and him having to be like, no, I'm fine. Yeah. Don't worry. This is a very, very, very long drawn out murder thing for my bitch of a wife. Yeah. Now, Max, have you ever seen Psycho? Yeah, I have. Because there's also a thing that happens in the bathroom in that. Very true. There's lots of very odd Hitchcock similarities that we'll point out through to multiple Hitchcock movies, right? You have the fact that there's no... There's no like diegetic music. It's interesting because in like, like I, the birds. I commented the first time. I was like, wow, that was the quickest drowning ever. And then she sends him, sends her outside of the room. Exactly. I'm assuming so he can get a breath of air. You said that and I just didn't say anything. Yeah. There were a few moments throughout the movie where I was a little bit worried that I had somehow <laughs> given you a piece of information and I'm like, oh shit. I'm trying to like preserve. The... Oh, and he, he floats up a little just so he yeah. can breathe. And the camera stays on it. Yeah. I, it's totally deliberate. This is fun things to notice. And the fact that she leaves the room and she puts the tablecloth over so that he can actually breathe. Yeah. Float up. You think it's supposed to what contain the smell or make it so they can wrap up it, the bro- wrap up the body, but it's so he can breathe. Yes. This was, Oh my God. Can you imagine the fucking planning stages for this that they went through? Yeah. It's pretty intense. I'd, I'd love to see a prequel to this movie called the, like the, the, <laughs> the planning of Diablique. And it's just like, oh, okay. So this is how we're going to do it. Yeah. My darling, don't you think we could just wait a month? No, we have to do this now. That's the weird like line you have to come up with in terms of like having a really great twist movie. Yeah. Is that you can so, you have to come up with something that's so unexpected that it's like, it makes the movie. But at yeah. the same time, if you're not skilled enough at doing it, you just 
when the when the reveal happens, you just have people be like, well, "What the fuck was that?" <laughs> Because it's just preposterous. It's yeah. like at the end of... You've seen Lady in the Water, right? Yes. Oh, my God. Where the buff guy who works out half the side... <laughs> half of his body, but only one half of his body, winds up being the hero at the end. And you're like, what am I watching? I just had a conversation. My sister introduced me to a friend of hers. who He's very passionate about film. I'll give him that. But he loves the weirdest movies. And he gives like legitimate reasons for why he loves them i'm like but you can find these things in such better movies like he was defending m night Shyamalan because he's like listen i just love the fact that he's an auteur and that he can still get his movies made independently of the studio system and they make money i'm just like okay but they didn't for like years they didn't for years and you can admire that now but there are other directors who can still do it better than he can and have made less shitty, shitty films. Right. And M. Night Shyamalan has made films inside the studio system that have been fucking terrible, so don't champion him. Also, he said that The Cat in the Head is a wonderful cinema, yeah, movie in terms of cinematography, so... Oh, it is. Yes. It does have a famous cinema. It was shot by Teen Cundy, was it not? <laughs> I believe it was. I'll correct that if I'm wrong, but I think it was shot by Dean Cundy. Yeah, no, he mentioned, I forget what famous cinematographer, because my eyes had rolled back so far into my head after he said that. But Yeah. Well, anyway, <laughs> I think uh, they do a really good job making his body disgusting. Yeah. He, that's goddamn right he's so ugly. Listen, girl, you're upgrading either way. Psycho, right? Uh, Psycho also has the water going down the drain. Yeah. And also one other thing to point out, there's almost that visual joke with this character where he has this weird fucking crane contraption, right? I don't, yeah, I don't even know what that's supposed to be. But it's almost just a visual joke that he's got all these pieces in front of him and he's trying to engineer this thing, but he'll never put the pieces together about this murder, right? Yeah. It seems like he's a guy, it's setting him up like with a hilarious visual cue that he's a guy who's going to quote unquote put the puzzle together and then he's just not. Oh, Max, wait a minute, do you have a piece of string or perhaps... Uh, rope. Dun dun dun. Or perhaps a stage fright. <laughs> or perhaps a rear window. I don't know, but or perhaps a Marnie. I think I, you're giving me some vertigo right now, man. Whoa! <laughs> we'll just end the podcast here. We'll never get better than that. It'll be fine. Don't that worry. That joke was so disorienting. You have to point me. <laughs> which direction to go I need to go yeah. lifeboat I need to my my phone's dying so I can dial M for murder um but <laughs> <laughs> god I tried not to laugh but it's just too stupid we're just we're just on a stupidity roll and I'm really proud oh fuck I dropped the IMDB page. where is it um yeah yeah uh, but Got to look for my yeah, Jamaica so, in. So, say goodbye. Yeah, say goodbye to these characters because Johnny World War Two is gone now for the rest of the movie, and we're gonna move on to our next red herring. The oh, is this gonna be the thing moment? But no, none of these ever come back, and we have. Well, I guess we'll talk about it when we get to that character where we have sleazy ambulance chasing detective man as the one who like. Fun fact about that character. Yes. That character was actually, this character, this is a fact, was actually the inspiration for Columbo. Really? That's weird. Because he seems almost tacked on in this movie. I'm, it's really strange to me that people have not tried to remake Columbo. I think they, really? Have they not? I don't know how you could replace Peter Falk. And he's just, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I didn't understand. But uh, did you say uh, you, the murder happened uh, in the bath that or in the pool? Or, uh, you know, I, I'd be astonished if there wasn't some shitty. Drive my wife crazy. I always forget. TV you know, movie the of the week type remake of that. Oh, like. May, like maybe a TV movie. Yeah. But I yeah. don't think people have tried to do a new show. If you really like this guy's party, party buzzer thing. It's just like, it's one of those things that like you remember because it's like it's so odd detail. and it like a thing that like, like the thing that the most thing that comes like immediately to mind is like, uh, you saw it follows, right? That weird clamshell. Yeah. Ship. The clamshell Kindle, yeah. whatever thing, or it's just like that didn't need to be in the movie and it serves no purpose, but okay, sure. 
I remember it now. <laughs> it's like the last thing I want to use to read a book. Yeah. Dun dun. And that was made when like smartphones were already a thing. So <laughs> I don't I don't yeah, know. Yeah, that movie has a I, weird I, technology thing going on. I like it follows it. a lot. I that's another movie where the ending of it follows is kind of well not the end end, but like the climax of that movie is really weird and sort of contrived to me almost. It would have like, made more sense if they like hid more details about the fact that it's her father figure who the shape is taking on at that point. Yeah. But, all, but they don't mention that at all. I'm just talking about purely practically in universe. Oh, you mean the fact that they're like, this is going to work. Yeah. Like have it, have a section where it's just like she gets unexpectedly farther away from the creature because it's like slowed down by water or something like that. Set it up in universe because it just seems like, oh, the pool, of course. What happened if you went to space? That will be when they make eight sequels from now. That's the movie I want to see them go to space. It follows X. Um, it follows in space. Yes. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I like that guy's dismissal of the guy who tells him to get out. I was he telling just does you, like the like hand talking. I was telling you yesterday that like I was half expecting him to like jump in the front seat of the car and steal it. And yeah, like, that yes, would that would be a different movie. That would be good. a comedy. Yeah. But like it almost seemed because the camera was following him and like paying attention to the driver's side door. So it almost seemed like that was going to be a thing or that they had to kill him, too. And now they've got two something like that or like he like tries to drive and crashes the car and now yeah. they need to find like a new car to get back home well even that is another interesting moment right you can see it as the tarp has like ripped right yeah and the guy who's like offers to clean it clearly thinks that he pissed himself he pissed himself yeah something but like it could that. it could be neither of those it could not be that the guy is wet it could be that he pissed it could be it, it doesn't matter though you know it's a fun fact is uh so there's a lot of stories about how uh, Andre Georges Clouseau was like a taking a method directing approach to this. So he created a deliberately hostile set environment to make people stressed. Um, but also one of the fun details is that he, uh, when they were carrying the wicker basket, he actually had that actor in there. No, oh, so they're actually realism. carrying a guy inside there. Ow. <laughs> Props to that actor, but also made him sit in the bathtub for two days while they were shooting the bathtub stuff. For two days, what? It took them that long to shoot it for some reason. And uh, so those eyes weren't fake. That was just like his actual expression by the time he was done filming that scene. No, he wanted to see how he could do it with his own eyes and he wasn't satisfied. So he had him put in those contacts. <laughs> and originally I was making a shitty joke. No, nope, no, really? Yeah. No, um, I'm saying like it was just that he was so tired. He was rolling his eyes back into his head by that point. But No, because mm. here's the thing. He didn't think he could even do that good enough, even when it was real. Oh, so he God. wasn't satisfied. But um, it's interesting because uh, I really love that detail at the end. And I'm glad that you have those shots of the contacts coming out. Because I think that's like a weird like cultural moment where people are like, what? He's taking yeah. his fucking eyes out? And it's like, I can't think of a movie earlier than this where people like like have like contacts or things like that with their eyes. It's such a weird thing for him to do that I think it weirdly sells that moment and gives it extra gravity. Where he's like just removing these weird contacts from his eyes in this yeah. bizarre, like ritualistic way. It's like, wow, that's creepy to look at. What if she died right here? Like this was the breaking point for her heart. <laughs> They're just like, oh. You can ask that question about so many different scenes. That saves... That saves us a lot of time, I guess. Now, Max, this I remember this moment when we were talking about the movie. I almost felt that I had started to spoil something for you here, where another talk about method directing, right? Yeah. Another weird true-to-life moment is that Vera Clouseau, who, by the way, we haven't mentioned this, she is the wife of the director. Yeah. I'm not sure exactly why he cast her in this specifically. He, She's also in Wages of Fear. But um, she, five years after this movie died from chronic heart issues much in the same way that her character dies. <laughs> and I said, in re I said to you in this moment, well, the actor also had the same thing. And I had to stop myself from saying she died like this character. Oh yeah. But you know, it was like she had the illness like this character. Yeah. And then I immediately brushed it off and it was like, Oh, would it be funnier if the husband, died in a strange drowning accident. Yeah. Well, actually, weirdly, people 
fucking weirdos, I guess, have yeah. like alleged that he also participated in killing his wife in the same way or um, whatever. Having her act in this movie like this. But. Or like when she died, like he had a hand in that. It's like, what the hell are you people talking about? <laughs> same people who think Kubrick faked the moon landing. No, that was Hitchcock. The, no, my favorite. With his birds. My favorite counter argument to that. It's become a joke, a very common joke now, but it's just like, yeah, Kubrick did film the moon landing, but he's such a perfectionist that he needed to film it on location. Ah, <laughs> there you go. My joke for that is you understand that to actually fake a moon landing would be more challenging. Well, yeah, that's not a going joke. To that's, just, that's just a fact that it would have <laughs> yes. been more expensive to fake the moon landing than it would have been. Be impossible. People have telescopes. People have telescopes. People could see that. But even like obscure things like the lighting, the way that the light is projecting shadows could only be happened if like the sun is hitting like sunlight is hitting the moon in a certain way. Yeah. When people make, by the way, just in case anybody doesn't know this, when people point out weird things about the moon landing photographs, yeah, it's photograph things. It's not because it's on a goddamn soundstage. There's this one because they're using cameras. <laughs> There's a one because a lot of flat earthers are also moon landing hoax because oh, one negates the other. But there's this one fucking hilarious video where like a guy like he like ups the contrast of something so you can start to see distortion around the things. And it looks like what he's saying is just like, oh, look, this image of the earth is like edited into it because there's like distortion around the edges when you up the contrast. It's like you think the U.S. government really like couldn't cut out a circle if they were going (laughs) to be putting that there. They would just like weirdly insert an image that way did he did he happen to no compress this image at all yeah it's fucking jpeg compression like anybody can figure (laughs) that out (laughs) jesus fucking christ well you know what those people they they provoke their comrades frivolity with absurd comments yeah that's what i'd say the principle is missing oh no I don't understand why this is such a salacious thing for them. Oh, yeah. Well, he just says that. What does it mean that his wine is chemically pure? I'm suspicious of this man after the first thing he says. The first thing out of his mouth is how he's going to spend the weekend naked. So I don't know. I I think it's supposed to mainly be because, like, you notice before, like, it's a table of adults. So, like, they should be treated. to ask for permission. Permission to drink wine. So I think it's more like, oh, we can finally get away with, like, you know, drinking like normal price not bargain bin shitty shit like we can live like humans without this cheapskate running everything yeah so i think that's why they don't care that much and uh here's where the movie sort of starts to begin its transition i really do appreciate how much time they spent building up to the murder yes because i think if you have too long of a protracted part of the movie where they're just waiting for somebody to find the corpse your characters f- start to feel too passive and it feels like nothing is happening um i think it's this is a good point to start comparing this movie to a previous movie we've done on the spectator film podcast welcome uh on strangers on a train yes where this is where the movie starts to become more hitchcockian because the deed has been done and now we have to suffer the consequences of knowing what has happened, and yet other people around you do not. And uh, the difference in this movie is that the characters are kind of passive, and we're waiting for it to happen, whereas in that movie, Bruno adds a level of excitement because he's a wild card, and Guy, even though he's very stupid... Has to try to find very, a way. Very, very stupid. Yeah, that's the other defense that movie has against this preposterousness is that the main character is insufferable. <laughs> well, he's an idiot. So, yeah. of course, he's going to buy into the fact that Bruno can actually incriminate him. Yeah. He, he can't. He can't. So, um, but neither of these characters are stupid. So, in any, in any like state's justice system and even Texas, like, I don't think Bruno would even be considered an accessory to murder. Not Bruno, but the... Guy. Guy. How could you forget that name, Max? Yeah, guy would be considered even an accessory to murder. <laughs> Strangers on a train, Jesus Christ. And F. That's the thing. We were talking about how the children in this movie are, like... None of them are characterized. They're all just, like, 
Only Monet, but barely. Yeah, barely. They're more just like rabble to like as a backdrop for this movie. But like you could have done something interesting because like it's only implied, but like the students don't like her, don't like the mistress and they love the wife because the wife is caring and nice and devotes herself to their studies and like they have sympathy for the wife and she's nice to them and then like the mistress like see the grading of papers it's like f f uh, i don't care i hate these kids she sees them she's yeah does the clapping with marching yeah it's also interesting to look at the degree to which the the students are characterized as just being rap rabble oh there's a nice yeah meta line what team are you on max yeah well what team are you on dumb. oh my god somebody put vaseline on the lens that's one thing that's interesting in terms of the uh, performance and the uh, behind the scenes stories is how much Simone Signore and the and French Ramy seem to be annoyed with Vera Cluzo. They thought she sucked as an actor and they hated how long they had to set up the lights to get they c- would complain about like her face being a plank of wood and they had to light it for hours just so they could get some sort of emotion out of it. <laughs> And I will say that, uh, you know, Simone Signore has a more, you know, stark, active performance. Yeah. But that if if Vera Clouseau's performance is wooden, it is wooden in a way that I think contributes to the character. And it's appropriate for the character. She's very, you know, uh, I don't know. She's weary, this woman, right? She's assaulted on all sides. Yes. She's just retreats into herself. It makes sense that that performance would be what's happening. That kid was way too eager to dive into that filthy fucking pool. Well, he's the skin diver. Yeah. What, do you think the corpse grabbed him? (laughs) And uh, also, if we're going to compare this to strangers on a train, like, here's the other thing. This is the start of where I feel like Simone Signore will start, like, expressing vocally, like, this this uh, sort of antagonism towards Vera Clouseau yeah. where it's like, she starts treating her like you're acting like a child, you know, she looks down on Vera Clouseau even here. It's antagonistic. And uh, I feel like that is not sort of conducive to the type of homosexual subtext. Whereas in strangers on a train, even though Bruno hates everybody except for himself, he's misanthropic thoroughly. Well, the, the queerness in strangers on a train is queer coding. It's the villainous character is gay because being gay is a villainous act. So we're going to code the stereotypical. Or at least it's like, and it's linked with that. Yes. Well, that's the whole point of queer coding is like, we're going to link homosexuality with bad people. So you, you make the assumption by yourself, you figure it out. But, but yeah. So like the idea is that, um, what I was going to point out though, is that Bruno is like pleading with guy. There's a pretense of like yeah. civility and that they're like old chums, yes. you know, it's very passive aggressive, but it's still there. And also the idea that Bruno chooses guy, you know, there's like a choice happening that yes. seems more like an idea of at least a certain type of mediated desire, you know? Um, and, uh, in this, it's just sort of like circumstance. <laughs> I didn't even notice that they put the fucking waste basket basket on the kid's head. I didn't notice they did it. I just like, I think because we were talking and then I looked up and I just see a kid dancing with a basket on his head. I'm just like, sure, these kids are crazy. <laughs> but look at like, they're terrible to all the other faculty members, but they like have genuine respect for her. And they're just sure, like, oh, despite sh- the gossip. Yeah. And the other interesting thing about this that we haven't mentioned so far is uh, exactly the specific type of like sadism that Vera Clouseau will experience throughout this movie. It's very much a uh, yellow wallpaper situation where she's characterized as having these health problems, but it's kind of like that 19th century, <laughs> early 20th century idea. You have ghosts in your blood. Do, co- yeah, do like, cocaine about it. Well, you're, you're a hysterical woman. Yes. You know, and that, that is both a physical condition and a mental condition. Um, so when you're upset about something, you're emotional. And you're hysterical, yeah. but also you've got a weak heart and you can't take stress, right? So we're not going to take your concerns seriously. You're, you're, you're a sick, sick woman. Yeah. Don't and you've got to stay it. in bed. Don't worry. We'll do everything for you. Yeah. So don't move. Don't breathe. Well, we get it more, even more dismissive later on when the doctor is just like, 
Yeah. She's about to die. Don't worry about it. Like, I just don't want to deal well, with it. We her. don't want her. Yeah. yeah. Although, even that is more mediated by like a, a financial sort of uh, You don't want to of... scare off customers with the notion that like somebody you're treating died. Yeah. Um, but also, I think the most patronizing is obviously uh, not Columbo. Yeah. Um, uh, what, whoever Ooh. that actor's name is. <laughs> Joe. Joe is that guy's name in uh, The Wages of Fear. And it's just interesting to hear the way French people pronounce their J's. Jo. Jo. Oh, my God. I Jules think, I think I Jules might have mentioned this on a jo. previous podcast, but... Um, what? I've had two friends who are French exchange students, one in high school and one in college. The one in college, I... Did you ever see the movie Raw? No, I haven't. Did um, that happen? But, so, very, very pretty French boy. Um, also <laughs> had... I had Huge crush on him, but he also had the most French fucking name in the history of existence. What was it? Louis Lecon. Emmanuel Pierre. Emmanuel Pierre. (laughs) I don't know. I think Patrice Lecon is still Patrice Lecon. Emmanuel, if you're listening, you were always super cute, and I wish I had taken up up a chance, but I was a nervous, nervous boy. Um, He's not. No, he's not. (laughs) He's he's dead. I literally haven't heard from him in like five, six years. Um, Yeah. Maybe that's him now. Yes. <laughs> I'm listening to the podcast as you're recording it. Yeah. Did that fucking boy on the stoop just look right into the goddamn camera? That's entirely possible. Child actors and nightmares. Oh, but. God. I just want to kill all of them. <laughs> oh, did I say that out loud? Sorry. We have to start the podcast over, Austin. God damn it. I can't let people know my distaste for children. You know, I was a child actor once. Yeah. Have I told you about the time that I was in a movie with... Uh, uh, what, uh, with uh, what's his face, yeah. Matthew Broderick. Just hell is just inject her with this fucking thing to put her to sleep. This is probably also a good time to point out how uh, frequently bars, vertical bars, are used as a motif throughout this. There's lots of. Situations where bars are created or just bars are created through shadows, lines, vertical lines, prison. You yeah. get it. You get the idea. She's imprisoned in this situation she's created for she's herself. She's trapped. Yeah. Very simple idea, but when you get creative with it, you can find a lot of ways to actually use that in your cinematography. And it's it's a trick that's done been done before and then done after, but like yeah. it's effective and if you don't it's not too obnoxious with it. If you're not just like if you don't have a character just being like grabbing them and just being like, oh, and lamenting like how they're stuck in this situation. If you just have it noted slightly in the background to influence your audience's opinion, then it's good. But like, yeah, well, uh, don't draw attention to how fucking clever you're being with this metaphor because that makes it insufferable and not clever. So here's probably a good moment to start pointing out another change that happens in the movie when they empty the pool and they don't see anything there. Right, this movie yeah. starts to embrace what Todorov, a theorist, would term the fantastic, which I'll define more thoroughly in the show notes. But it's essentially this idea that I think we've referenced in other film, in other commentaries, of the uh, sort of sometimes you might refer to it as dialectical, or like a yeah. dichotomy between um, what you'll call like ontological, maybe or epistemological usually in horror movies and with ghosts. Yes. Is it in my mind epistemological or is it real ontological? Um, movies that pl- we briefly were talking about, like the witch and hereditary movies that play with supernatural elements. Yes, that's very that. much the dichotomy that they're using to... M- movies that play with that idea yeah. are some of my favorites. So but. it's a very useful term in that way. And yes. um, Todorov has his own terms for like, you know, the the two sides of the coin. I think he uses like the marvelous and then whatever. Um, but the idea is you're committing either to they, the supernatural element exists ontologically or it's in your mind. Yeah. Or it's a ruse or whatever. Um, this movie winds up going in like the Anne Radcliffe direction. It Radcliffe's us where it, it teases us with supernaturalism and then it winds up being a rational explanation. But this is where that, really starts to take hold, right? And uh, I think you, this was the first moment you really like, wow, I get Hitchcock vibes from this now. Yeah. Because you get 
the weird performativity taken to a new level where they are given this weird object, right? And Hitchcock loves telling stories through objects that have multiple meanings, depending on how much information you know. And uh, they now have this weird interaction over this object. And how do you interpret this object? Because there's no explanation for it, right? And uh, it introduces that sustained ambiguity is what Todorov stresses, in, in terms of describing what's fantastic is the sustained ambiguity between these two things and not allowing you to really al- arrive at a conclusion. I just want to, it's, it, I, I'll, if you want to keep going with that idea, I'm not going to interrupt you if you want to keep expanding on it. But, um, I just was like rewatching this scene. Like it's just hitting me how much I had bought into the fact that the husband had to be dead. And like the most, I, the closest I ever got to it, was thinking that it was the mistress did want the husband dead, but like she was going to do some like fan dangling to make it. So she was like the inheritor of the school and the money. Yeah. But like, cause I started to suspect her because like none of these other characters have enough agency to really do anything about it. And the movie's kind of going to be shit. If it's just like, Oh, it was Mr. Drain. Yeah. It was the Mr. Drain all along. Um, that was the foreshadowing when you saw the water going down the drain. Yeah. said it was, he was the, puppet master but so i figured it might be her but i i like just that scene i'm just like i never had any doubt until the end of the film that he was 100 percent dead and it was just somebody fucking with her yeah but good on the movie for playing me that hard like i said like and i was very anxious at the end of this movie i really wanted to know what happened next i was literally on the edge of my seat leaning forward Austin was like, because Austin was like, okay, this is going to be a bit different, but I just want to check in with how you're feeling. And like, I didn't say this to him, but I was getting annoyed <laughs> with you at some point to a degree. I was like, stop talking. I'm trying to intake this. Well, yeah, I, I yeah. it is, it, it is a sort of shift that makes you like reevaluate the terms of what you've been watching. And now you're like, you, it's a different level of engagement because it's now like, step by step, you're like, what is going to happen? Yeah. You know, whereas leading up to it, you're like, you have answers. You're like, okay, either they're going to kill him or not. Yeah. They have their plot. You know what they're going, moving towards, right? And in this, you've reached the point where you're like, I don't know what they're moving towards. Yeah. Because I didn't expect this to be the path that this would choose. And I think it's an interesting like shift in storytelling. I don't know if there's a good term for that in terms of like narratology where it's like storytelling where it's like you have characters with desires and you know what the movie is moving towards because the characters are moving towards this or that. But this, the characters have no goals. Yeah. They're just like, what is happening? We don't want to get caught for what we did, but like we're not even sure if that's something yeah. we can be worried about because what the fuck, where's the body? Like you have no idea what you did anymore. Yeah. And now the rest of the movies, the characters just trying to come back and identify what reality is. And I, that's a weird, different type of storytelling because you're not, it's hard to predict what's happening because you're just there to learn what is going on in the first place. You, you brought up before the idea of just like, is is it in their head or is it real? And there was a scenario. I didn't vocalize this and I'm very glad that like the movie wasn't this dumb at all. (laughs) Okay. But, um, I got an idea that it was going to be like a thing where it's just like, Oh, like they keep talking about her weak heart and everything. And it's just like, she's going to be like, have been bedridden this entire time. And it's going to be something she dreamt about killing her husband. Yeah. Like a fever dream. It's like an escapist fantasy for her trapped in this shitty situation. Um, but I'm, I'm glad the movie didn't do that because I kind of would have hated it if it did. So if it was all just a dream, yeah, that would also have been perhaps novel in a certain sense at the time. And also it would have been a twist, but that's just the example of the laziest. Yeah. Most aggravating twist. Because I know, like, that it was all a dream thing gets a lot of shit, but, like, unless you can find a really, really creative, interesting way to do it. Oh, I'll try. Yeah. It makes me question why the fuck I just watched your movie. Because yeah. Because none of it matters. You've got to get creative with that. Yeah. And you also have to find a way to not sacrifice consequences. Somehow. 
the a, a way to do that would be have a portion of the movie be real and make it ambiguous when the cutoff for the dream was so that like there are something happened like something happened in your movie and it's not just a waste of my goddamn time and this we have yet again with that character being a good actress where it's just like you think she's just like oh well no i'm not gonna call the police because obviously i'd be more implicated for murder than you would but no it's her just like playing off the whole it's great i like this you're you're acting on two levels and she does it very well even if she is just straight faced and hard to show emotion it fits this role perfectly and i'm not sure if that's just the actress to be paised yeah praised or the director for putting her to such good use in the film but it, well i think it's you know obviously it's going to become a mixture of both right well yeah obviously but, but like it's so perfectly done i didn't appreciate that as much as the first time i did it but how convenient is this for them by the way what that this just happened because they didn't plan this the fact that there's a body found matching his description pretty well. How do you know that? Uh, I guess they could have murdered somebody and done that, but the possibilities are endless. It makes you wonder because it makes you also wonder how much of this did they plan out to begin with? Or they're like, we're just going to create the terms for this new stress to hit her where, where is the body? And then we're just going to see how long it takes and we'll just get creative. We'll come up with new ways to make her think that you're dead. And then just well, as we go, we'll wing it and we'll figure out new ways to torture her. Here's the thing. I don't think they killed a man because the whole reason they're doing this convoluted murder thing is so it can look like the wife died from natural causes. So there's no suspicion. So that's a good point to jeopardize the entire plan by just murdering a stranger that kind of looks like the guy is like outside the MO of this whole movie. So, but like, Paul Servino, by the way. It is weird that, like, because she, <laughs> the woman was just like, she just got the paper. She literally, like, the paper boy's like, it's the ink's still wet, don't smudge it. And, like, she's instantly just like, oh, God, this is, <laughs> she must have been, like, in her head, like, wow, this is perfect, awesome, okay, cool, go, go to the morgue. Look. But even that is not truly a resolution. Because then you still have the answer of, how did he get out of the pool and get into the river? Did somebody take him out of the pool? He didn't get out, out of the pool by himself. Yeah. Walked to the river. Oh, no. He just went down the drain and ended up in the river. That's, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, obviously. Did a skin diver come and take him? Yeah. And put him in the pool or in the river? And, like, yeah, he's like, you think here it's just going to be like, oh, no, it's not him. But, like. And you know what? I don't work at a morgue. But, uh. People, listeners who work at a morgue, do you like do you like gotcha quizzes for people looking to be like trying to confirm if their husband died? Yeah, and it's not like a thing where it's just like, oh, the widow of this husband gets one million dollars. <laughs> it's just like, do you sit them down and you ask them like, listen, if your husband's on a train headed to Chicago <laughs> and there's another train coming from Chicago to New York at 35 miles an hour and they pass each other at 2 p.m. and the conductor of the train your husband is on, it has blue eyes. Also, is this like, your husband? <laughs> I've, I've been with some people for like years and they had like very serious relationships. If somebody was just like, so what about that birthmark on their lower left thigh? I'm just like, what? Are you telling me you're not a skin freak? I'm not. I don't like physically memorize every part. There are like things where it's just like, oh, yeah, she has like a distinct freckle like somewhere. But like, I'm never just like, oh, yes, I know everything about location. That's just weird. Like at most like. They would be like, oh, do you have like a picture of you with the deceased or something like that? Like if you're being really scrutinous for whatever reason, like why you want to limit who can come see the body? Like, But wait, you're telling me you're not like a cartographer of like bodies? Yeah. You don't like have skin lamps mm-hmm. or anything? No. That sounds like a, like a bad Jeanette Winterston book. Cartographer of the body. Skin lamps, another possible punk, li- yeah, punk band name. Oh, I'm sure. Or a cover band of uh, the Flaming Lips, oh, Skin God. Lamps, Skin Lips.
What are some good... Oh my god, what is it? I was talking about King Crimson with somebody recently and we came up with the shitty all-female cover band Queen Magenta. Um, to people who like King, Crim- yeah, King Crimson, what? please explain the appeal to me. I've just never been able to get into prog rock and I would love for somebody to explain why people actually like it. I just, like prog rock? Yeah. I'm just not a fan. Never, never really have been. I think you are. Mm. You know who's prog rock? Who? They did some scores in the 70s for a few movies that I know you're a fan of that are Italian. Is Goblin really? Yes. I wouldn't, I don't know. In fact, Goblin has a fun about them though. That's why Argento wanted them because they were like prog rock and he's like, oh, this band, Cherry Five, they're a prog rock band and... That's why he got Keith Emerson to do the score for Inferno. Because he was an Emerson, Lake and Palmer, which I he was a real fan of. And trust me, sometimes I'm like, I don't understand your maybe it's infatuation just more, with this Dario. Maybe, it, maybe it's just more King Crimson, where it's just like, this isn't my thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> You're trying real hard. Yeah. I, I have tried real hard to like King Crimson, but it's just not, not my cup of tea. Well, anyway. In the Hall of the Crimson King is fine, but meh. Well, anyway. What kind of shitty cab driver is just like, no, I'm not going to take you to this place? Well, Max, we had the same debate yesterday, and as I told you, he did a cost-benefit analysis in his head. But a cab driver fucking charges you for how long they take you. It's not like a set rate. It's not like you're giving them five bucks, and it's like, okay, take me to the other side of France. Maybe he works for a cab company that has a flat rate and a rate that has diminishing returns for him. After a certain point, maybe he doesn't take home all of his pay, Max. That's entirely possible, but also like you are not considering the full economic situation here. Have some sympathy. Yes, for this character that we never see again. You're absolutely right. I'm right. very sorry. Oh, by the way, we're getting introduced to Not Columbo. Yeah, to Sleazebag McGee. Um, and I know people seem to like talk about him as like some sort of magnanimous character. It, could it really just be us where we're like? This guy is like an ambulance chasing detective. Yeah, because like he flashes a police badge, but like he's retired. He's retired. So it's a badge that basically is like a pol- the police permission. So like, yes, this guy is a licensed private detective. Yeah. But um, and he's hanging around a he morgue. Doesn't, he doesn't present it that way. He presents it as if he's already with the police. Get force. in the car, ma'am. Yeah. To get a foot up. And then only after that, he's like, oh, you have to pay me to do this because well, I'm a yeah, private eye. I mean, look what he's doing right now. He's like, listen, if I don't find anything, you don't have to pay me. Yeah. But if I do find something, then maybe, you know, some compensation here. And also, it's just like he's hanging around a morgue looking for people who are emotionally distressed because they're trying to confirm whether or not somebody they're, they're like that's important to them is dead. So he's preying on people in a moment where they're emotional. Yeah. This guy is a sleaze. I did, like and then some he, people have to know that, right? Yeah, and it then can't he, just be us. And then it even inadvertently is like he's the hero because he's just like, oh, he shows up and catches them at the end. Bye. No, he lets her die. Yeah, for whatever reason. Also, don't creep around people's rooms when they're like sick, especially. Right? Yeah, that's weird that ha- that happens. But, um, Has that seriously never been discussed before? I figured that was like a foregone conclusion. <laughs> I mean, people talk about him being like, you know, kind of bumbling and ineffectual, but I don't think people talk about him literally just being malicious and passive aggressive in the way that he approaches this entire scenario. Yeah. He's just, I, I mean, really at this point in the movie, he's more antagonistic than anything, you know, because he, he passive aggressively butts into the situation and now he's just another like, <laughs> element for them to deal with yeah we don't know yet that they're not actually guilty of murder morally they're they're guilty of murder but that's not the point point is in a court of law they're not responsible for anything yet really because no one's dead well i don't know in france but like could you be convicted of conspiracy to murder without actually killing to somebody because conspiracy to pit mur- yeah commit murder yes but also if there's no body and there's like he, the principal's been like he's missing, but nobody's reported it to the police yet. And, right, like it's a thing of like if you can't con- 
there's no evidence. There's no nothing at the moment. So like there's, I don't know. It's a weird situation. Yeah. And if he is still alive, then like, yes, if he went directly to the police, he could be just like, oh, these women tried to kill me and instantly most likely get them in jail. But. So here's some interesting dialogue, too, just in the background from the students talking about the Alps being very high. They separate France That's from Italy. That's another thing. What? He could have just, like, I don't know. If he wants to keep the mistress, he can't do that. But What? He could have just, like, come to the police and just like, these women, they tried to murder me. They tried to drown me in this swimming, uh, in this bathtub and then dump me in a swimming pool. Well, that's the other thing is yeah. that if only Simone Signore had did, they'd planned it in a location where like, yeah, like uh, it was not owned and operated by her. Yeah. Right. And you could somehow plant evidence on Vera Clouseau. You could just get her locked up and people would probably go along with it because she's been established as hysterical. Right? Yeah. And they'd be like this raving woman just had to kill her husband, even though he's a perfectly reasonable guy. Or no, not even that. Like, you have, like, the fact that, like, oh, yeah, of course she wanted to murder him. Like, he openly had a mistress that, like, he was terrible to. We know he's terrible to the wife. He made her eat rotten fish in front of the entire school for no reason. Yes, you just make the motivation very visible. Yeah. And then you do the same thing. Yeah, that's another way you could take it. But it's much more cinematic and entertaining the way the movie took it. So why no. not? And that's really why this movie is successful is because it takes advantage of the scenario it creates fully cinematically. And, you know, maybe people could say to us, like, how come other movies are weighed down by, by you know, inconsistencies or whatever? It's like, yes, but this one, this one requires the inconsistencies to function and yeah. the, th- the experience it creates is incredible well that's the thing like there's to a certain degree you have to make things cinematic and fun to watch that's why i always like i know you're gonna groan when i bring this up and i bring it up because i groan a lot where it's like people to this day on the internet are still complaining about minor changes they made in the harry potter movie yeah harry potter movies in general where it's just like the one i've seen brought up one million times is there's a scene in the goblet of fire where it's supposed to establish that like Dumbledore inherently trusts Harry where he's just like, did you put your name in the Goblet of Fire? In the movie, he's like, did you put your name in the Goblet of Fire? Yeah, that. And it's just like, okay, you can complain about that, but also you want to move things along in a movie. You want to make things cinematic and entertaining to watch. Like they're going to change things in a book because sure. you're not just like the book yeah. is not a screenplay. You have to change things in order to make them visually entertaining to watch because when you're reading a book, you're creating your own masterpiece movie in your head based on it if it's written well enough. So sorry, people who are really passionate about the purity of the original work, but in order to adapt it to a new art form, you have to change some things, just like they had to do with this movie. Right. But also that that just goes for plot lines as well. Yeah. You have to focus some things, and especially if you're making this type of movie, a type of Hitchcockian thriller. That's how it works. You focus on some things. Lots of Hitchcock's movies have an element of implausibility. Rear window. Why is nobody looking back out the window at Jimmy Stewart until the end? Yeah. He's got huge-ass windows. He's just sitting there with a goddamn giant lens on his camera. And there's a woman who's like half-nude dancing. You yeah. think she wouldn't fucking, that'd be the first thing. As like, you do. People, women would just be like, of course I'm going to buy huge ass iron shades for my goddamn window. People just look at me when I'm wearing all my clothes when I walk down the street. Yeah. So there's lots of stuff like that. I have no doubt that there's plenty of women who like to dance naked alone in their apartments, but like, but you're not, probably going to close your, the window open. Yeah. You're going to close your shades. Max, first. She doesn't even have shades or blinds to begin with. Yeah. She doesn't have curtains. Nothing. <laughs> Dun, dun, dun. Another scummy thing, because it's like very obvious neither of these women want him around at the moment, but he's like either oblivious to social cues or like refusing to pick up on them because he doesn't get paid otherwise. Yeah. Well, also we were speculating too about like the the degree to which his behavior... <laughs> that's a really funny reaction shot. Yeah. That's he's a great like, moment. What the fuck are you looking at? Oh, there's the suit. Yeah. But also, uh, interestingly enough, 
the degree to which um, that makes you retroactively like reevaluate how Michelle made Christina spill the drink on him. And he's yeah. like, oh, my gray Prince of Wales shirt. Yeah. Come here and wipe it off and look at it. Remember it. Right. Remember this. Now, again, could not have anticipated this, but it's just great to see how that pays off. You know how like. <laughs> please don't be back, please. But it's great to see how they pay that off later and how yeah. she like bumblingly confesses some sort of weird information that kind of it doesn't incriminate her, but it makes them more stressed out. Uh, the fact that she knows all this stuff off the top of her head, but of course she knows because he very traumatically forced her to understand this when, yeah. when, when she killed him. I guess. Yeah. But I was more talking about like a birthmark on his left thigh or something like that. Yeah, yeah. that too. Are they talking about canceling like Latin classes or something like that? I don't know. I'm more curious about what this boy is doing. Oh, is he's picking up leaves. That's yeah, right. with his hands. It just, when every time I see that, I'm like, it reminds me of that scene in like Monty Python where, he, where they're like, oh, here's some good dirt here. Right? And yeah. they're just putting it in a sack for some reason. The guy's <laughs> yelling about the violence inherent in the system. Yes. Oh, I'm being oppressed. Some... <laughs> oh, my God. Watery tots, though. It's <laughs> What? Some watery tart threw a scimitar at me. <laughs> and I said I was Not kicked. some farcical <laughs> aquatic ceremony. <laughs> oh, my God. Quality films. All, all of the Monty Python ones. Have you ever seen uh, Jabberwocky? Which uh, is also medieval, directed by Terry Gilliam and made immediately after. A while ago. I remember almost nothing about it. It's I have seen really it interesting visually because it's just fucking disgusting, that movie. Yeah. And still kind of zany. And that one has a really great knight outfit uh, with the giant, like, dark knight or whatever that the guy has to fight. It's not yeah. that great of a movie, and it's too long, but it's it's sort of neat visually. Oh, and this guy tries to mansplain, yeah, mansplain away her <laughs> delusions. Well, yeah. Also, it's he's giving the hilarious Freudian, like, the yeah. kid broke the window in his subconscious. He generated the idea of the punishment. Yes. He was taking on the role of the other of daddy to punish himself. <laughs> well, this guy is basically the psychologist at the end of uh, uh, Psycho. Yes. Well, it's like apparently not all of these kids are in need of yeah. good parental figures because their parents send them to the shitty boarding school where they serve them rotten yeah. food and it looks like it's falling apart. So. Sure. But also, like, I, I'm glad that the movie just totally dismisses him immediately when he's yeah. opening his mouth because, I mean, he's offering this paradigm that is clearly false because we know it can't be that because the they did kill him. Yeah, he's dead. Yes. And in like rewatching it, it again, you get the thing of just like, oh, it's the mistress who's the one shutting him down immediately and planting the idea that he's a pathological liar. And then the other two who are just kind of like stooges who will go along with anything. Yeah, they're just like, flunkies. They're just like, oh, okay, yeah, sure, whatever. Yeah. But it's it's interesting, you know, the way your assumptions are changed about like what they say because we are already sort of implanted and settled on this dichotomy of it's a ghost. Yeah. That's vengeful or somebody's fucking with them. And I think we lean towards the vengeful ghost. I know thing. what you, I know what you did last school holiday, like that last, time. <laughs> last French boarding school <laughs> holiday. Yeah. yeah. But I think we lean towards the ghost thing because Simone senior Ray becomes stressed and she can't provide an actual answer. Yes. You know, whereas we know that Vera Clouseau is religious and superstitiously religious, right? Unreasonably so in the degree to which she is uh, sort of ritualistic in her beliefs and how she believes in the consequences of their beliefs, right? Um, but at least that's an answer, right? Whereas Simone Senior Ray doesn't really have an answer, but it's easier for us to really start feeling tense because we're suspecting the answer that is given to us. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, you can't necessarily feel tense and like nervous in, in anticipating what's about to happen if you're not sure what it is. No, because you're sure he's dead. He yeah. has to be. But, oh, God. What's the point now? I'm finished. 
give me back my marbles. But she's clearly lost her marbles. Cause oh. But, but also, Max, you could... <laughs> Why is that played like a comedy shot? Well, it's just because Monier is still standing there. Yeah. And you're like, has he just been standing there since like Overnight? yesterday? <laughs> They're really, really mad at him about that. But you could also look at that marbles bit, Max, as uh, money. Give me back. We're fighting over marbles here, right? Well, yeah. We well we also had the boys fighting over a pack of cigarettes earlier on in the movie before vacation in exchange for letting the one boy peep at his sister. He was oh, content. fuck! That's right. We're, oh God! We were gonna get give get a pack of cigarettes, Jesus. but then the uh, boy was like, "No, it's not worth a pack of cigarettes." Oh, there's the other psycho connection: peeping at people through peepholes. Yeah. And we missed the strangers on a, a train connection where they have a picture of uh, French Ramy playing tennis. Tennis. And it's almost the same exact situation where the guy who plays tennis marries a woman for her wealth and status. Yeah. What is with you, tennis players? What did you do to to deserve this? I'm sure you do deserve it to be treated this way by movies. Well, maybe it's like, because tennis has always been considered, like, at least on the male side, an elitist sport to a degree. Like, well, I, one of the funniest things I think you've ever said on this podcast is, during Strangers on a Train, you just randomly at a certain point go, I'm sorry, but any sport you can play dressed like that isn't a sport. <laughs> I'd forgotten about that. I don't so, of course, it's elitist when you're wearing a sweater or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> playing tennis. It's like, like polo where it's just like, okay, whatever. It's like rich people with like, t- like they've already done everything because they have so much money. And... It's just like, uh, can we invent a new sport? Sure, you hit a ball with a hammer while you're riding a horse in good clothing. Sure. Whatever. Whatever. Yeah. Oh, here we're going to get the other interesting line about money. Taking her to the clinic would have been way too expensive. Between you and me, there are no heirs. Yeah. That's the thing? You're a doctor. What the fuck is wrong with you? Well, I think they're just being like, oh, it's a shame that that money is going to go nowhere. Yeah, goddamn. If only we could just squeeze some of that money out of him before she died. Now, how did the principal, did he like duck his head away real fast to make it so it was Well, blurry? it's interesting. If you look at that shot, there's a little gleam in the yeah. right window. It just, I don't know if that's something specific to like this, to this print that they used or if it's an actual part of the movie. But if you go back and you watch that scene, people, you will see in the right window that just as the picture happens, maybe it's a reflection too from the photograph yeah but right in the window there's a like it just there's a highlight for a second Ooh. and it looks like somebody like taking a glare from a light and flashing it at the lens for just one second i've missed that both times so i don't know yeah go back and watch that and see if there's something there uh this movie definitely seems like the type of movie that would play with that and actually have an image not like I, I don't think it would go full thing with having him in the background. No, but, but it, it would, would definitely have like a little light, trick of the light or something. Yeah. yeah. Ah, the boys catching on. Yeah. Yeah, because you're such a great watchman. Do do. Oh, I thought you were going with Jurassic Park there. I was Stop it! Very I keep getting that out of my head, and you keep bring, yeah bringing it up. Would it be funny if they looked through an exhibit and they just saw that, <laughs> like the sliver of a guy's face, and here we have a man's face, a ghost face. <laughs> where would we go anyway? Is this the scene you were talking about where it took them so long to light it to have her start showing emotion, or is it later? I, I think the actors were just complaining in general. Oh. Because this is her first real emotional outburst of just like, oh, I'm nervous. I can't. No, I think it's she has an outburst throughout the entire movie. I don't know. Well, she's like very strong willed and sort of like, I'm doing this. The, yeah, we're doing this the entire movie. But this is like where she starts to crack. At least this is where she's like giving up, basically. No, I'm saying the mistress like. She, oh, she's starting to crack like she's like or crack, quote unquote. Like. Oh, I didn't mean her needing the lighting. Oh, I meant okay. Vera Clouseau. OK, she was annoyed. Simone Signore was annoyed. Same, oh, okay. same with French Ramey. I misunderstood. In fact, they were so annoyed um, that they were not on speaking terms after this movie. Basically, really? Simone Signore was married to uh, Yves Montan, who was a big French star at the time. And he was in 
Wages of Fear, which okay. was the previous movie that this guy had made. And that's how they met. And they say, hey, we should do a movie. And by the end of this movie, they were not on speaking terms anymore. Oh, God. I don't know if they ever reconciled anything. And here's just more evidence for the gay subtext. We yes. didn't mention it before, but they also sleep in the same bed yeah. the night of the murder. Um, so clearly, there's still elements of that in this movie. And we have, yeah, the, right there, we have the callback to the line that they said during the divorce conversation. But um, And now you have it when they're breaking up their partnership of murder together is breaking up and... Like I, like I said, I was expecting to try to find more queer subtext in this movie. I'm kind of satisfied with the fact that it's residually left over from sure something else. Yeah. Um, and I think, uh, you know, it's, it's still bizarre to see that, but I don't know. It's just part of why you want to see this movie remade. Yeah. Also, so we can just not have to deal with this super creepy man anymore. Why is he in this room? Yeah, why, what are you doing here? I was just looking at you. Don't worry. And that is such the wrong answer. Yeah, bad touch. <laughs> bad touch. I came to make my report to you at midnight when you're wearing the see-through nightgown. We found your husband. Yeah. So, again, this will become the ultimate ultimate patronizing scene where he's going to look down on her and say, you're insane. Yeah. Don't worry about it. You crazy hysteric woman. Your husband's not dead. And this emotionally for me is really like the height of like yeah. the weird sadism where this is the most like yellow wallpaper moment of this movie where it's like, this world and the other people in this world are so cruel to Vera Clouseau that it makes me sort of yearn for more sort of substance from her death and her suffering than I think we get. That's the thing. Like, I think a lot of, because I really like this movie, but I think a lot of the issues I have with it could be completely almost eradicated if we extend that ending a little bit if we can see the impact from her dying, like see the children, like, cause the children love her. We've established that numerous times throughout the movie. See the fallout from her death. See like the impact of the boarding school fall apart now that they have the movie and then have them arrested. If you really want that to be how the movie ends. Yeah. Extend it, extend the revelry and the terrible act you've committed. Or, the le the or at least sort of extend an idea of consequences yes. of this. Because as it stands, it does feel like there's an, a disproportionate focus, focus on the suffering, and then like there are less consequences, yeah. right? To the point where you really, like, it might not occur to you how sadistic the situation is the first time you watch it. But truly, this is the most cruelest way you could kill somebody. Yeah. Right? Literally stressing them out to death. But Like, okay... I compared this movie and the like Ballyhoo at the end kind of to William Castle. And I feel like there's a line of comparison there in terms of how this movie was marketed and just that approach to making a movie that is totally like William Castle, I bet saw this movie. Right. But really there's a scene just like this in the tingler where a woman is scared to death and then the tingler snaps her spine because <laughs> she's mute and she can't scream. Yeah. And that scene is basically this entire movie protracted for 90 minutes. So it's weird to me that, that, you know, we just move past it and then we just end with that little warning. Don't spoil the secret. And it's like this woman's suffering was just to give us the secret to have for the movie. And it's kind of disappointing. Yeah. Also, how do the boys know about the wicker trunk? Do they just hang around the garage a lot. Yeah. They're just flies on the wall. Yeah. And of course, these two gentlemen are just rats on a sinking ship, and they're so stupid, they just realized it's sinking now. <laughs> yeah, but the, 
I love how they're just like, oh, you're a witness that I don't know anything, dear colleague. You as well, dear colleague. I like that. It's just like, yeah, we're going to look out for each other, but fuck everybody else. The first time he opened that, did you think there was something behind them? Behind him? Some of the light shifts behind him as he opens the trap door. Possibly. And the first time I saw this movie, I remember being distinctly like, what? Like he was about to get axed or something. Yeah, kind of. And I'm orchard like that's the trope that I think kind of emerged slightly later after this movie of just like Yeah, maybe more with Psycho. Yeah, kill the nosy body. Um or the detective who is like picking up on things but doesn't yeah. actually appreciate the severity of their situation until yeah. it's like too late. Right too late. Yeah. So here's where the lighting changes just a little bit. We get some of that great low key lighting that I'm gonna say almost in certain shots, kind of Val Luton esque. Yeah. And you get a sort of interesting match cut with the door in the background there in the same position. Oh, but we're coming up on probably my favorite scene in the movie. Just the long, long, suspenseful, slow build up to yeah. the climax. And I'll say uh, a lot of the camera placement here and just the way they direct this is reminiscent to me of some of uh, Rose or er, of some of not Rosemary's baby specifically, but some of Roman Polanski's best work in how he would use a camera in domestic settings, you know, where there's just hallways, rooms, looking out of windows. And somehow he would choose the perfect lens or the perfect place for the camera uh, to make it very anxiety provoking. Yes. Which this is like, because when I was watching this, I'm just like, who is it? What's doing this? Like, is it right? Because we've seen other characters introduced with their hands. Yeah. In the previous scene, we've seen the detective introduced with his hands. We had the whole thing where, like, when the suit's first brought in, like, we see his hands, but the suit is covering the guy's face, so we're not sure who it is. It's just, like, ambiguity <laughs> through hands is a thing. We know it's a... We don't even know if it's a male at this point. It's just, right. like... Everything we've, we're seeing to build suspense so far, we've seen before in this movie, Right. Yeah. So this entire time we're like, oh my God, is it the ghost finally? Or is it yet another person? Is the like, yeah, there's a black man yeah. they're playing our final cards. Is it? And at the same time, it's like, is it, is it an unrelated party? Is it just like some weird thing where somebody's trying to punish her for her sinfulness? Like, right. Is it something like I was very perplexed and I was very anxious to find out what was going to happen. At this and point. the other thing of course is how, this movie now benefits from the fact that we do not have a clear understanding of like the geography of not geography, but just the uh, sort of the layout of the school, the architecture, yeah. it becomes a maze now yeah. and it becomes very nerve wracking because we don't understand the directions people are coming from or going to. Yeah. It's claustrophobic. It's yeah. just like, well, you have like these thin hallways that are, You've thinned even more with the darkness. Like you only yeah. have like the light to illuminate a small area. It becomes Val Luton-esque. Yeah. Essentially. Although you did laugh sometimes with the creaking doors. I, I laughed once <laughs> because it sounded like the AOL messenger, like sound when somebody uh, yeah, comes online. That, <laughs> what? That, that might be slightly before your time, but, um, there's like you talk like you're fucking significantly older than me, sir. No, I'm not significantly older than you, but like this one case, it might be that like I, cause I was just on the tail end of that. So like I'm from the nineties to a degree. Um, <laughs> but there was like this, the, it's just this like door creaking sound when somebody comes online and it's so distinctive and like, it's the most stereotypical, creaking door sound effect and everybody has it. And then, yes, I made it because you had been talking to me about like, say what you're thinking, but like the scene goes on for a while and I go in and out of doors and I'm just like, okay, Scooby-Doo, let's, let's move it on. Here. Yeah. But no, I was, the scene was very effective to me. I just, yeah, it's like, just great Val Luton type of lighting. I just felt like I should say something, you know? Fortunately, the first time we watched this, the garage didn't open and ruined the suspense. Nah, I, I'm not even sure if that will pick up on the microphones, but we'll see. Nah, we'll see. The other thing I wanted to mention about this sequence is how very much the lighting, we get the soft lighting behind her a lot. Yeah. And uh, that definitely, for me, in, com in combination with just her nightgown, turns well, her into an eroticized victim, which is strange to me because she has not been eroticized. 
so far in this movie. No, she was, well, she was raped, but that was more just like to show how scummy the husband was more than anything. Right. Like, it's, well, but there's no, there's nothing erotic about rape. No, of yeah. course not. But like I'm saying like, it, no, but I mean this it, movie's portrayal of her. Too. Yeah. It wasn't yeah, done. What in you're any, saying is right. It wasn't done in any sexual way whatsoever. Also, I'm noticing, did they just put glitter on her forehead to like represent sweat? Cause that's what it's kind of coming out. Just beads of sweat. Yeah. But every shot is just perfectly chosen. Uh, and just the idea to use the non diegetic sound, right? The typewriter going off. We get this moment that is weirdly like that is diegetic prescient sound, of the site of the what? Isn't that diegetic sound though? That's what I said. You said non diegetic. No, oh, well, yeah, diegetic sound. And we get this moment weirdly prescient of the shining, right? Yeah. There's lots of scenes that this this sequence seems to like predict or um sort of set up for future filmmakers to pay off. Um, there are so many scenes in movies of just women in horror movies walking down hallways yeah. nervously. And uh, this is just a classic example of that done very well. I mean, yeah, like one of my favorite movies of all time, Suspiria. Suspiria, Suspiria oh my God. is a movie mainly about women walking down hallways. But um, Yeah, and then it ends the same way. She opens a door and then learns yeah. something really scary. That's and the then thing. is also li- visited by the living dead. Yeah, uh, that's the thing. People are always just like, oh, that's one of your favorite movies. Tell me what it's about. I'm just like, a dance school and witches, question mark? Like, It's about some witches. You know yeah. what I'm saying? It doesn't matter. But Now, Max, what do you think she was going to see here? What did you think? I, okay. So before I saw him in the tub, I thought it was just going to be him standing there and just was like, I'm alive. Or it was going to be the blackmailer or the whatever revealing themselves this like it came off as supernatural and i thought she might be having a hysteric fit of just like i've lost my mind i can't deal with the guilt anymore right but no god the shot choices are just so excellent (laughs) just instantly dead oh no oh god (laughs) <laughs> other thing is that he can't actually see her yeah so he had to know she was in the room so right. i guess he got kind of lucky i hear the door open and they're just like the screaming um and i guess he he's like okay when i hear a thump i'll know that i can take these things out <laughs> yeah exactly but man that's just such a fantastic image it is a great reveal even if i feel it's a little rushed at the end and yet again we've been pointing out the entire time it's convoluted okay i'm sorry but but i i have to point that out i didn't notice before that she was still breathing when he felt her pulse yeah i think that's just a fault on the actress's part but but really you're not going to do another take you don't check somebody's pulse if they're still breathing Mm, true no it's not over also, how did you sneak back in? You left. Mm-hmm. Also, how did you fill that bathtub? Whatever, it doesn't matter. Well, don't worry. He's used to being wet. Yep. We've been in a trunk for quite a while. It took you more than an hour to get in that tub without... What? Yeah. You know what? I am I'm glad that Hitchcock did not get his hands on this, too, yeah. by the way. I don't know if he would have tightened that up a little bit, but I'm glad that this movie exists the way it does. Um, also because Hitchcock not getting his hands on this movie and being gypped and annoyed that this, this movie was very successful is what gave us Vertigo. True. Those writers wrote that book specifically for him, I believe. Oh. And even though it wasn't a huge commercial hit, uh, obviously it's become a very valuable movie on its own right. And just him being annoyed and getting like a crab up his ass about this movie is not just responsible for Vertigo, but multiple movies that you could say are sort of similar to this one. So we get this end, this part of the ending. Yeah. Where it's like, how did you get the slingshot back? Oh, that she gave it back to me. So is this implying a supernatural thing? Is it surviving? She survived the killing. Yeah. I mean, people could say that this does not ultimately commit itself to the idea of the fantastic because it arrives down on it being again, Anne Radcliffe. There's an explanation for yeah. it, but 
also you could see this as also maintaining that tension between them, yeah. right? To a certain extent. Also, you could say that it's just like the ultimate moral of the movie, really, right? Where it's like you're not really going to find answers, but morally, what can you do? You just shoot your stones at the institution and see if you can break some windows. Hey. And that's how you live life, right? That's that's That might be the smoothest transition you <laughs> ever did. It was timed yeah. perfectly. But yeah, so here we get the nice little message at the end with the William Castle value. Don't tell them value. what you saw. Thank you for them. Thank you on their behalf. Yes. Is what that means? Yeah. But either way, that has been Lady Avalique. Well, th- Austin, thank you for showing me this movie, Ed. And thank you on behalf of our listeners for... Giving them a spoiler for, yeah, warning. For, yeah, for so, what I support. So they can or, enjoy it by themselves. Certainly not thank you for recording this podcast. No, but you guys keep coming back, so we're going to keep doing it. So. so, yeah, we'll see you some other time, losers. Yeah, you can check out our podcast at. Uh, we are on Spotify, iTunes, and Stitcher. We are at spectatorfilmpodcast dot com. Spell it backwards. No. Um, <laughs> yeah, you can check us out in all of those places. Follow us on various forms of social media. If you're on it, we probably are too. So look us up there. All right, and this has been the Ides of March, and uh, Austin.